Okay, Mr. Marshall, we're looking good. I have made you the co-host. The attendees are coming on over. We have quite a few at this point. Uh, I have 634. We have Amherst Media in the house with us. I do believe you're ready to go. Okay, thank you, Pam. Welcome to the Amherst Planning Board meeting of July 19th, 2023. My name is Doug Marshall, and as the chair of the Amherst Planning Board, I am calling this meeting to order at 6.34 p.m. This meeting is being recorded and is available live stream via Amherst Media. Minutes are being taken. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this planning board meeting, including public hearings, will be conducted via remote means using the Zoom platform. The Zoom meeting link is accessible on the meeting agenda posted on the town website's calendar listing for this meeting, or go to the planning board webpage and click on the most recent agenda, which lists the Zoom link at the top of the page. No in-person attendance of the public is permitted. However, every effort will be made to ensure the public can adequately access the meeting in real time via technological means. In the event we are unable to do so, for reasons of economic hardship or despite best efforts, we will post an audio or video recording, transcript, or other comprehensive record of proceedings as soon as possible after the meeting on the Town of Amherst website. Board members, I will take a roll call. When I call your name, unmute yourself, answer affirmatively, and return to mute. Let's see, Bruce Coldham. Present. Fred Hartwell. Present. Uh, Jesse Mager. Ma Do you say your name Mager or Mager? Uh, Major, actually. Major. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Present. Um, I, Doug Marshall, am present. Janet McGowan. Present. Johanna Newman. Present. And Karen Winter. Present. Board members. If technical issues arise, we may need to pause to fix the problem and then continue the meeting. If the discussion needs to pause, it will be noted in the minutes. Please use the raise hand function to ask a question or make a comment. I will see your request and call on you to speak. After speaking, remember to remute yourself. For the general public, the general public comment item is reserved for public comment items regarding uh, not on tonight's agenda. Please be aware the board will not respond to comments during general public comment period. Public comment may also be heard at other times during the meeting when deemed appropriate by the planning board chair. Please indicate you wish to make a comment by clicking the raise hand button when public comment is solicited. If you have joined the Zoom meeting using a telephone, Please indicate you wish to make a comment by pressing star nine on your phone. When called on, please identify yourself by stating your full name and address and put yourself back into mute when finished speaking. Residents can express their views for up to three minutes or at the discretion of the planning board chair. If a speaker does not comply with these guidelines or exceeds their allotted time, their participation may be disconnected from the meeting. All right, so I'd like to start by welcoming the two new members to our, to our board, uh, Jesse Major and Fred Hartwell. Welcome to both of you. Um, I guess uh, I wondered whether either of you wanted to say anything to introduce yourselves, uh, tell us anything about your history in town or what you do or anything at all. Uh, if not, we can just move on. Jesse, do you want to say anything? Uh, sure. I've lived in pretty much center of town for six, 17 years since I moved here. I'm a professor at UMass. Uh, I'm pretty excited to be part of this group and uh, looking forward to learning a lot and participating. So thanks. Thank you and welcome again. Fred. Uh, <clears throat> well, yeah, this is my second time around on the planning board. I was on the board, I think it was 96 to 2002. I'm not 100% sure of that, but that, that's very close. <clears throat> and uh, I've lived in town since 1965. And <clears throat> I've 
owned the uh, building that I now live in for 51 years. And uh, uh, yeah, and I uh, have a considerable history with the with the planning board. I, I chaired the zoning subcommittee uh, just uh, during the six plus years that I was on the board previously. And I think I can be of uh, some help. I certainly have considerable institutional knowledge of, uh, of often in terms of how things got to be the way they are. Okay, thank you, Fred, and welcome. All right, at this point, we will go ahead and start or uh, open the general public comment item uh, for the public. Um, I see that we have 17 attendees. And I think at this time we um, actually no, I'm I'm out of order here. We're going to go ahead and do minutes. I'm sorry. We have one set of minutes. Uh, it's the May 17th minutes. And uh, at this time, does anyone have any comments on the minutes as drafted and put into our packet from Chris? Johanna, you got your hand up first. I think these minutes are excellent and I move to approve. Okay, thank you. Janet, you have your hand up. Yes, I will second and then I have something to add to the minutes. Okay. Which, which is um I left the meeting after the first agenda item and so I didn't I didn't hear anything about the lighting thing. So I think something has to say Janet McGowan left the meeting. Okay. So um Johanna, are you okay with a motion to approve the minutes with that one edit? I am. And Janet, I presume you're okay with your second in that? Yes. Okay, good. Are there any other comments from board members? Uh, Chris and Pam, you're fine with making that uh, edit to the, the minutes? Sure. Okay. All right, uh, we'll go through and do a roll call for this. Starting with Bruce. I approve. Thank you. Fred. I will be abstaining because I was not a member of the uh, board. Okay, that sounds good. Uh, Jesse. Also abstain. All right, very well. Janet. Um. I was going to abstain because I just didn't see the second half of the. I never watched the second half of the meeting. So, as long as you have the votes. All right. Well, we'll see how it goes. Johanna. Approve. Karen. Approve. And I'm going to approve as well. That's four in favor, three abstentions. Can we squeak by with that, Chris? Mm -hmm. Yep. Very good. All right. Now we'll go to general public comment period. And uh, I usually run down the participants that we can see at this point in the meeting. So the names that I see are Anthony with no last name, Bill Zito, Brian Rafe, Chris LaRose, some uh, C. Salem, D. Jones, Dylan, Gerard Burke, uh, probably Ray Jackson from Eversource, Josh Lee Smith, Justin Pennington, Ken Colette of Eversource, Kyle, Marie Cosgarten, Maura Keane, Mike Kane from Eversource, and Stephen Berger. All right, so at this time, are there any members of the public that would like to make a comment about a topic that is not later on tonight's agenda. Okay, I don't see any hands raised. So I guess we will go ahead and move on from, from here. So the time now is 6.44. And we'll go on to the next item. I guess this is item four on our agenda, 
This is a public hearing for site plan it's, review. It's oh, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Chris, you said you had given me some notice you were interested or that Kyle was interested in reversing the order of these uh, hearings. Is that right? That's right. Um, Kyle Wilson is a representative of, Ar of Archipelago Investments, and he is on vacation with his family up in Canada. And he would like to, um, if if the board agrees, have his portion of the agenda taken first so that he can spend the evening with his family. Um, and Kyle is in the audience. And I have a statement that I'd like to read before Kyle um, makes his presentation, uh, if um, Doug, if Mr. Marshall agrees that I can do that. Well, my one concern is that we advertised this item for to start at seven o'clock. And it's um, quarter no. seven now. We, we didn't advertise this item for any particular time. Okay. This is old business, Mr. Marshall. Okay. All right. Well, then in that case, um, Fine, let's go ahead to Kyle. So, um, all right, so my explanation is uh, to bring people up to speed who weren't part of the first um, go round. And I don't think anybody here was uh, on the board when this project was approved. Um, the project at 26 Spring, Spring Street is a mixed use building and it was approved by the planning board in 2018. It has experienced a number, a number of delays in getting built. And the primary delay was associated with the pandemic when construction was halted for an extended period of time. So now it's finally um, on its way to being completed and Archipelago Investments has a goal to have the building occupied later this summer or early fall. Um, the site plan review decision from 2018 had some conditions that need to be addressed before Archipelago can obtain a temporary certificate of occupancy. And so the building commissioner brought this to my attention. Um, Mr. Wilson is here in the audience and he will make his presentation as soon as I'm finished. Um, there are four conditions that need to be dealt with. Um, condition 10 states that landscaping and site amenities shall be installed in accordance with the approved landscape plan prior to the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, except for difficulties associated with the planting season. So that's a little bit of a hang up because um, right now the planting season isn't preventing Mr. Wilson from uh, installing the landscaping and site amenities. It's really the delay in the uh, construction of the project. And then condition 11 states that if a temporary certificate of occupancy is issued by the building commissioner prior to completion of landscaping, a surety in the amount equal to the remaining costs of the incomplete work plus 50% shall be first collected. So the first thing that the building commissioner had uh, an issue with or a concern about was, first of all, he considers in condition 10, the term certificate of occupancy applies to any certificate of occupancy, including temporary certificate. So that condition um, is in conflict with a condition that is later on. Um, and we can talk about that. Um, but the, the building commissioner essentially wanted to bring this to the planning board's attention and make sure that um, if the uh, applicant or if uh, Mr. Wilson agrees to um, his list. He's given you a list of issues that need to be addressed. And then if he uh, provides the surety in the amount of 150% of uh, the amount that was um, in the letter that he submitted, uh, that, th that he would satisfy the requirements of condition 10 and 11. The building commissioner didn't want to make that um, judgment himself. Um, so the way it, it uh, conflicts with condition 27 is that condition 27 states that the final certificate of, of occupancy shall not be issued for any building or unit until the final top coat of paving for all driveways and access areas, drop off areas, sidewalks and berms has been completed and landscaping as shown on the plan of record has, has been installed. So you can see that that condition 27 is more lenient than 10 and 11 put together. So the building commissioner just wants to get clarification from the planning board that um, the way he's proceeding is appropriate. 
Um, Mr. Wilson gave us a letter uh, which listed the things that still needed to be done, and I added them up, and it came to about four hundred and twenty thousand dollars by my addition. So he would be expected to provide a surety in the amount of one hundred and fifty percent of four hundred and twenty thousand dollars in order to complete the work. Um, Okay, so that takes care of those conditions. Then condition 29 required the applicant to provide a written description of the guidance or recommendation that he would be providing to tenants on the topic of finding legal parking spaces in downtown Amherst. And the reason for that is that um, there's no parking provided on the site. Now, no parking is required because the uh, building is in the um, municipal parking district, which um, doesn't require on-site parking. But there was a requirement of that um, of that site plan re review approval that he provide a written description. So he's provided that to you. And then condition 35 required the applicant to incorporate screening or window film or other appropriate type of glazing on the windows on the south side of the building to prevent glare from the sun shining into the town right of way and adjacent properties. So the applicant is seeking um, consideration from you and approval that he either will meet or has met those conditions. And, and now I think you can turn it over to the applicant and have him uh, tell you how he has met those conditions or how he proposes to meet those conditions. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Kyle Wilson, welcome. Good evening. Uh, so talk to us about your project and what you're asking. So thank you for having us. Um, as Chris mentioned, this project has a long history. We got approved in 2018, and then we resubmitted uh, when we were applying for our building permit in August of 2019. Um, so subsequent to when these conditions were written, there was a, another uh, planning board uh, appearance, a couple, um, uh, where we described the drop off and all the site improvements, including uh, our uh, hope to be able to bury the power lines and get rid of the poles that uh, remained on Spring Street after the town and Amherst College had started the burial of that work back in 06. Um, so, um, so we started after we got approval from the planning board to get our building permit in 19 and we shut the project down on the day that Boston shut down all construction uh, for COVID. Um, we restarted the project in uh, February of 22. Uh, the project has been able to proceed through some very difficult supply chain challenges. Most prominent is the electrical switch gear, which just showed up uh, last month, uh, many, many, many months uh, uh, delayed. Uh, Western Builders is doing a wonderful job uh, trying to uh, work within a, a tight site and work within the utilities and uh, the new buried power lines um, out front um, and uh, have have been able to negotiate that quite well and I think keep the site under very good control. So um, uh, we are looking to move people into the building August 1st. Uh, we were originally looking to move people in July 1st. Before that, it was June 1st. Um, and with each switchgear delay, it, it kind of got pushed back. Um, the, I think the low hanging fruit um, on some of the conditions Chris, met, Chris mentioned were the, uh, the shading, which was a, a discussion with Lindsay Schnarr back, way back when, and was, um, we discussed using solar band, which we ended up um, installing, as we said we would, on the glazing. So I think we've, um, uh, I think that condition uh, should be uh, all set. I think the parking uh, email that Alex has used to uh, anybody that's applied or signed a lease at Spring Street uh, has been forwarded. And then I think the conditions 10 and 11 and 27 are, are uh, where we are. Uh, my interpretation of 10 and 11 were relative to a temporary certificate of occupancy, not a complete certificate of occupancy, which is why we're proceeding. Um, the, uh, the work that we've tried to put in to deliver a very high quality building and a very tight site um, on, on a uh, site that previously wasn't paying any taxes has been very difficult, um, but we are very glad that we're almost to the end. We're very glad that we have tenants who very much appreciate the building and are looking to move in. And we are hopeful that the planning board can 
um, see that we have done what we need to do um, by uh, providing a surety to be able to do that. So I, I look forward to talking with you. Thank you. All right, thanks, Kyle. So am I right that we have basically three decisions to make? One is, are we okay with the surety for the landscaping? Are we okay with the solar ban for the window treatment? And um, the third one that- uh, As the parking email. The parking Alan. email, yeah. That the parking email is, a, is an acceptable satisfaction of the condition. Uh, Chris, do you agree those are the three that we need to be probably voting on? I think that's right, yep. All and right. it's um, landscaping and site amenities. So it's, you know, all the walkways and all the paving around the site. And, and that, that's Chris, all contained in that one surety. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sorry, Chris, is there, a, is there a vote required tonight on any of this? I think it would be a good idea to have a vote, yep. Okay. All right, um, board members, it's time for comments and questions. And I see two hands. Janet. So Chris meant it, mentioned glare. And then I remember reading about that issue in, um, I think, the record of the decision. But I don't really see a condition that says no glare. So I might have missed that. And then, so that's my first question is, is there a condition saying no glare? And then the second question I have is for Mr. Wilson, which is, does the solar ban treatment plus the windows that you chose prevent glare? Um, okay. And well, if the answer to the second one is yes, I think we're all good, but I just want, I didn't really see that condition. Okay. Chris, uh, which item on the approval talked about glare? There is one. And why can't I find it? I'll look too. It's it's thirty five. Oh, okay. And Thank back you. in there the notes, yeah, even, it was one it of the even, ones that was mentioned. Yep. It even mentions the solar ban. I think in in the meeting minutes mm -hmm. further up, and that's what we've got and submitted on. You so the so, so the solar ban does prevent glare. I just didn't see it in the sheet that you gave me. But what's that? I'm sorry. Does I'm the sorry. solar ban uh, prevent glare? I mean, or you know, uh, I mean, the the purpose of the of the solar ban is to is a window film that does a number of things. It helps with insulation. It helps with glare. It helps with ability to see through it, um, so that is not crystal clear. Okay, that, would, that was something that um, they submitted along with uh, other submittals at the time of their approval. Yeah as a way to accommodate the discussion that had come up that was about shading and us not wanting to integrate wood breeze soleil on the exterior of the building, we said we would accommodate with a solar ban. And we didn't think glazing was a concern. Every piece of glass has reflection to it. Um, so I think the solar ban was what we discussed and what we provided. All right, thank you, Kyle. Uh, Johanna. Great. Thanks so much, Mr. Chair. Um, I think we should not belabor this too much. Uh, um, it sounds like there were a lot of conditions put on the building. Some of them are now kind of as the rubber hits the road, a little bit contradictory. I am totally satisfied with the parking communications. The solar ban seems to address the clear problems and setting aside more than 150% or setting aside 150% of what's projected to do the final sidewalks and landscaping seems prudent. So it seems like the building commissioner has put forward a recommendation. I don't have any additional questions about that and would be prepared to just move to approve it with, you know, approve the recommendations of the building commissioner. All right. Uh... Glad to hear you're prepared to move. That doesn't sound like that's a motion yet. So let's let's get a few more comments out if people have them before we get to the motions. Bruce. Yes, uh, I, I think I understand the solar ban. The the uh, when you put this film on, it reduces the visible light transmission, which in certain instances would be perhaps problematic. Maybe more in commercial than in. Uh, 
but with very small rooms and so forth, it seems to be a, a, a good use. Uh, so that's fine by me. The written description is fairly clear. Um, I think the uh, uh, I reviewed the, the the cost of works that was provided by Western builders. Um, I don't think any of us here is really in a position, certainly not me, to judge whether that's accurate, but it's got Western Builders uh, uh, name on the letterhead. They're the contractor. They've been in the Valley for years. I've been associated with them over the past. They're a good crowd, so I don't see why there would be any likelihood that uh, their representation of the costs would be inaccurate. So I think all three of those things are, are uh, I'm comfortable with. the. Uh, I thought there was one question about whether there was a conflict between Condition 10 and Condition um, 27 and uh, and I thought that might be the the matter than which we are more concerned but from my point of view I I would uh, say that even if there was a, a conflict and it was within our capacity to uh, resolve it by uh, by fiat uh, I would say that we should this is uh, th this project hit the, uh, the 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 prime time at exactly the wrong time from the point of view there's been invidious uh, circumstances associated with trying to move this forward so I think that um, uh, that our, our, our um, we, we should be uh, sympathetic to the uh, uh, to the circumstances uh, and uh, recognize that getting everything done and under circumstances like these is really very difficult and secondly I think that it's clear that this developer both of them uh, to particularly uh, Mr. Wilson is a has done development here before and presumably will do it again. He's not an old man. He's got a family. His kids are in school. He lives in town. He's not going anywhere, as far as I can tell. So often these conditions are more appropriate for or more important for folks who are passing through develop, uh, companies and so forth. And this, uh, the, all, all, all indications are that that Archipelago is is not such a, an organization. So I think uh, all things considered, I'm. Uh, comfortable in supporting a motion that uh, Johanna may make. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Chris, I saw your hand go up during that. So the only um, comment I wanted to make was that the building commissioner um, wanted the planning board to um, kind of override the phrase, except for difficulties associated with the planting season. In other words, um, the planting season would be fine to install the plants now. But because the site isn't ready for the plants to be installed, um, he's willing to grant this, um, you know, to have the certificate of occupancy, the temporary certificate granted. But he wanted to make sure that the planning board didn't have a particular reason for that phraseology. And um, he acknowledged that it was a kind of, what should I say, vestigial phraseology. This was, uh, you know, approved in 2018. And now we probably would have. Um, you know, rectified the apparent conflict between condition 10 and condition 27 a little bit more um, assuredly, but we didn't back then. So that's why uh, he wanted us to bring this to you to make sure that the planning board was okay with going ahead with this. Okay. Um, Fred, see your hand. Uh, yeah, I just, uh, the, I would suggest that the way to handle that when whoever's going to make the motion could simply say the requirement in condition 10 relative to uh, the completion of uh, landscaping to the contrary, notwithstanding. And that will squarely address the building commissioner's concern. All right, thanks, Fred. So, um, Mr. Wilson, um, by allowing this, uh, allowing the, the CFO uh, prior to the landscaping be, being finished, uh, do you intend to install the landscaping this fall or could it be yes. later than that? As soon as possible, the landscaping will go in. So, it'll be after the TCO and before the uh, the CO. All right. And um, I mean, would you be amenable to our putting some sort of time limit on installation of the landscaping? Sure. Um, okay. Yeah, there's no problem with that. Okay. 
Um, well, uh, I guess I was wondering whether we would want to try to get to ask to put as a condition to to uh, have the landscaping installed by the end of this calendar year. Um, is that a that's reasonable fine. proposal or not? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, from my side, thank you. Okay. All right. So I see two hands. Maybe a couple of board members want to comment on whether that seems like something worth doing or whether we should not bother. Bruce. Um, I was going to make a motion. So if Fred's, got, uh, if Fred's got something to say, and this would be speaking to a motion, uh, I, will, I will yield to Fred. Oh, he's not there anymore. Yeah, Fred has dropped his hand. So you have the well, floor. Um, I guess, um, how to word this, uh, move that the board support the uh, applicant's uh, um, request for a partial, uh, a temporary certificate of occupancy, uh, uh, notwithstanding uh, uh, condition 10 of the original decision, asking that the uh, landscape be put in, except for difficulties arising in planting, season um, that uh, the uh, condition number 11 requiring a surety be uh, provided on the basis of the uh, data submitted by Western Builders, uh, that the uh, solar band product uh, uh, as presented uh, be applied to the uh, fenestration, and that um, the uh, uh, and that the written uh, the, the, the written description uh, uh, regarding guidance to tenants seeking parking is deemed acceptable. Um, uh, further, that the uh, uh, board uh, um, asks that the uh, maybe asks maybe requires uh, the that the uh, landscaping be completed by the end of the calendar year. Well, let's say that the board expects that the uh, landscaping work shall be completed by the end of the calendar year. I think that covers it. Pam, did you get that? Pam, you are muted. We heard, saw you nod. I'm sorry. I have I have an elder dog here with me, so I'm kind of muted. I, am I still muted? No. No. Okay, I think I have it. Good. It's. It, I think it was fairly. Uh, verbatim so it's on the record at least that's right thank you all right does anybody want to second that motion well i will go ahead I'll, and second that i'll second all right or defer to your second doug <laughs> <laughs> chris and pam you can you can pick one of us Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. Board members, any other uh, discussion that people would like to make? Johanna? I just want to say that I've been biking by this site every morning for the past two years, and it has been just wonderful. Like all every interaction I have with the builders is wonderful. They manage the site really well compliments the lord jeff the scaling like i just um i just want to say kudos to kyle and his team um because i think it's a really just a nice addition to our town downtown i appreciate that very much thank you all right thank you johanna all right anybody else have any uh comments all right i don't see any other hands all right, so uh, we will vote on Bruce's motion. Uh, a yes vote is endorsing the motion and a no vote is opposing it. Bruce, we'll start with you. Yes. And uh, Fred? Yes. Jesse? Yes. Janet? Aye. Johanna? Aye. Karen? Aye. And I'm an I as well. That's unanimous. Seven votes in favor. I appreciate it very much. I appreciate you guys listening to uh, us taking us first here as well. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Thank you, Kyle. Have a good night.
Good night. All right, so the time now is 7.09, and we will go back to the fourth item on our agenda, which was the uh, public hearing. For ever the, first, so. the first of our two public hearings. Uh, so pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, and extended again by chapter two of the acts of 2023. This meeting is being conducted via remote means and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2023-06, NSTAR Electric Company, DBA, doing business as Eversource Energy at 246 College Street, this concerns Amherst Electric Substation number 17K. The applicant requests site plan review approval to install a new approximately 1,550 square foot, 13.8 kilovolt metal clad switchgear enclosure and associated foundation. Extend existing perimeter fence 65 feet toward College Street resulting in a substation yard extension of approximately 7,020 square feet. Replace existing chain link security fence with similar eight foot high fencing topped with an additional one foot high barbed wire, including fence exceeding four feet in height along the frontage in accordance with section 6.29 of the zoning bylaw. Install six inch crushed stone install conduit and necessary trenching, including associated relocation of curb cut and improvements to sidewalk along frontage. This is in the commercial zoning district, uh, the parcels on map 14B, parcel number 173. All right, so we'll start. Are there any board member disclosures for this site plan review hearing? All right, I don't see any hands for that. And in that case, we will welcome Eversource. Actually, Chris, I see your hand. Do you want to make a fun I, introductory note? I just wondered if um, Mr. Collette would like to um, have some other people brought into the meeting uh, from the attendees list. I think Josh Lee Smith might be one of them, but maybe mm -hmm. Mr. Collette can tell you who's, who he wants to be brought in. Uh, yes, thank you. you. You read my mind. Actually, that was um, going to be my first request. We we do have uh, Joshua Lee Smith, who is um, representing Eversource in this matter uh, to speak, and then also Justin Pennington will will sort of review um, briefly some some slides with the board. Uh, so if those two could be added at this time, I think that would be helpful. All right, and we'll leave Mike Kane in the in the uh, attendees. Is that right? I, yeah, I think Josh is going to introduce the project and then and then turn it over to Justin. So if anybody else needs to add anything or if there's a question that comes up within someone's particular purview, they could probably raise their hands to answer to it. Okay, great. So welcome all of you. Tell us what you're interested in doing. Uh, good, good evening, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the board. First of all, uh, if I can do a sound check, can folks hear me okay? Excellent. No. Okay. Just... So for the record, my name is, is uh, Joshua Lee Smith. I am outside counsel for Eversource in connection with this project. Um, this having been the first time I've been before this board, uh, would it be possible to, we have a brief slide deck um, and Justin Pennington, who I believe has also been admitted as uh, a witness here. Could he get uh, control with respect to sharing of the, of the screen for that? Josh, as a panelist, anyone as a panelist can can share their screen. So, Justin, go ahead okay. and give it a go when you're ready. And um, there, there you we go. go. Okay. Um, so, as I mentioned, we have a, a, a very brief uh, slide deck. I'm going to kick things off, and then I'm going to hand it over to uh, Justin. Um, Mr. Chair, you gave a very, uh, very pretty thorough um, uh, overview of the project itself. It's a relatively straightforward project. Um, the site itself is uh, a, an unmanned substation, it's an electric substation. It has been in existence and, and in operation 
for decades, um, actually going back to as far back as 1917. Um, so it's been there for quite some time. Um, uh, Justin, could you advance just to the next slide, please? And here, here's a depiction, an aerial depiction of, of the site. Uh, so um, this property is located in part in, in the commercial zoning district and in part within uh, one of the town's residential districts. Uh, the vast majority of the site work, however, is going to be occurring within the commercial portion of the property, which is the pro portion of the property that is closer or closest to College Street. College Street being the street that you can see uh, on the bottom of the of the screen, and uh, as you had mentioned, Mr. Chair, uh, this site, which is it's about a five acre site, um, so it's it's fairly large in size. Um, uh, it involves the installation primarily of what's called a, a switchgear enclosure. This is a some might refer to this as a utility building. That's what it would generally look like from the outside. Uh, if you ask a, a, an EverSource engineer, they may say that it's more like a piece of equipment. Um, so it is an integral part of the existing electric substation that is there now. Um, and as you can imagine, and I know that there was a site visit to the site uh, yesterday, and I'm sure the members are probably familiar with the site even before that. Um, this is somewhat of a typical uh, outdoor uh, electric substation, mostly op uh, open air substation. So you've got uh, transformers, circuit breakers, uh, dead end structures, uh, typical types of equipment. Uh, including the switch gear. And so uh, what the, primarily what's happening here is uh, Eversource is looking to replace some of the uh, uh, more outdated equipment uh, with new uh, uh, up uh, state-of-the-art equipment, including this enclosure, which is approximately 1,500 square feet in size. And in order to accommodate that, they need to expand slightly, uh, modestly, the existing substation fencing. So the security fencing, um, which would be closest to College Street, there's going to be a slight expansion with respect to that. Um, so with that, that's my my brief overview. As I said, we've got a very brief slide deck to run through. We've been working very closely with uh, Chris and Nathaniel and, and, and the town's staff, other colleagues in connection with this project. We had pre-filing meetings talking about the need for this project, which is generally to improve the overall electric uh, reliability uh, of electric service for the town um, and we've, we've provided a number of materials had a bit of back and forth with respect to um, uh, some of the landscaping which hopefully the board is um, um, pleased with uh, and will be satisfied with with respect to this project um, so we're we're looking forward to uh, getting the project going and we can talk a little bit more about time frames um, later on but uh, at this point i'll pass it on to, to justin Hey, uh, thanks for the introduction, Josh. So uh, yeah, my name is Justin Pankton. I am the uh, assistant project manager on this project, working closely with our PM team of Caroline Salem and Brian Rafe. Um, I'm gonna be presenting or going through the slide deck for you today, um, going through some of the drawings we submitted as part of our application as well. Um, and we do have other members of our team that I think are within the waiting lobby, viewing lobby that, um, will be available to answer any questions you might have regarding engineering or environmental. So um, I'll kick things off with the PowerPoint presentation. So as Joshua mentioned, uh, Amherst 17K substation is an Eversource substation located on 246 College Street um, within both the general and commercial zoning districts. Um, primary objective of this project will be replacing the uh, open air breakers with a 13.8 kV metal clad switchgear enclosure. Uh, these substation upgrades are necessary to improve the reliability of electric power for the town, as well as eliminate obsolete equipment within the substation. Uh, as we see here, this is just a front view of the fence uh, looking into the station from College Street. Uh, Details regarding the enclosure and the fence. Um, the picture you can see here on the left is a typical picture of what a switchgear enclosure would look like being installed in an Eversource substation. Um, and on the right is a typical picture of what the fence will be replaced to. Um, this new fence is eight feet tall plus one foot of barbed wire 
uh, which coincides with Eversort standards for safety and security. To accommodate adding the switch gear enclosure into the substation, we're expanding the fence approximately 65 feet towards College Street. Um, this will allow room for us to add the switch gear enclosure south of the existing open air breakers, as well as enclose um, part of a new transmission structure that was recently installed by another project. Um, we're hoping that the expansion of the fence will facilitate space for both the new switch gear enclosure, as well as providing space for um, trucks or other Eversource equipment to enter the station and uh, overall improving station access um, for Eversource workers. Uh, as of right now, um, pending approval from, from, from the planning board, um, we are targeting starting civil construction in fall of 2023, around September or October. Um, following this, uh, through 2024, um, we will begin pre-outage and post-outage construction um, following delivery of the switch gear enclosure from our vendor. Um, and the following drawings were some of the submittals that we sent with our application. This is just the general site plan um, that includes the uh, expansion of the fence, uh, the switch gear enclosure, um, and some small other details regarding curb cut and the fence. Uh, th this is our substation access uh, addition plan. This includes how station access is going to be um, changed at the station in regards to the curb cut and plantings along uh, College Street. Mm -hmm. This is an example of a blue point juniper of the planting that we propose to install in front of College Street. This was the draining and drainage plan also submitted uh, with our application. And that's all I have on my end. Thank, thank you, Justin. So we, as I said, we've been uh, in pretty uh, consistent communications with uh, Chris Restrup, uh, Restrup and uh, Nathaniel Malloy in connection with our submittal. Um, we provided uh, some responses uh, to some of the initial staff questions uh, that they had posed and provided some supplementary materials, including some more details with respect to the landscape plans uh, that we've shared that, that you can see tonight. Um, we also uh, are in receipt of a staff memo uh, that Chris and her team prepared, and we're in agreement with the um, conclusions that were set forth in, in the findings that were set forth in that staff. So with that, we're, we're happy to answer any questions that the board or the, or the public may have. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Josh. Thank you, Justin. Board members, uh, a number of us uh, made a site visit last evening. Would any uh, board member like to give us an overview of what we all saw when we were there on site with the Eversource folks yesterday? Okay, nobody's volunteering. Oh, okay, Johanna. I can try. I always feel a little intimidated doing this, but um, so let's see, we met in the parking lot just in front of where the current substation is. And there were, I believe three people from Eversource there who gave the basics of the project. One of them walked into the parking lot to show where the front fence line was gonna be we discussed the presence of the stream to the, I guess it's the, the east. east of the site and how they will remove the vegetation that's currently there along the fence line. And then we talked about how at least the frontage on College Street will be an improvement. The curb cuts will be clearer um, and you know, and so instead of there kind of being a dirt parking lot and then the old building with kind of driveway in front of it, there'll be vegetative screening there and then the couple of curb cuts. We did not walk um, the full perimeter of the site on the site visit, um, but I 
no, I went this morning um, and just looked around the backside um, and Janet, I believe had walked the site as well. Um, Doug, am I, can I report on that now or should, or is this just the site plan? You might as well mention it. It was an observation of a site visit. Great, okay. Um, so on the, if that's the east, that's the north side of the substation fenced in area. There's essentially a small dumping ground. It doesn't look like any waste that ever source generated. To me, it looks like waste that has been dumped there from residential usage, but there's a significant amount of debris. Um, there are lots of kind of pieces of disposable plastic waste like bottles that I think uh, put the watershed at risk. And there's a lot, there's just a lot of stuff there that, um, I don't know, I seem, I, I think is inappropriate for um, like having right there in the wetland next to the stream. So All right. those um, are my observations from the site visit. Happy to, yeah, open okay. it. Up. Let's see, there were several of others of us there last night. Does anybody want to add anything to that? Bruce? Um, yes, I think it, it, it I, everything that Johanna said is, is 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 salient and so forth, but I think it would be worth reporting additionally that we noted that there is now a significant amount of parking across the front of the building, and and that will be pretty much all removed. Um, it was explained that the uh, this is a, a an unmanned substation, so the use itself degenerates no traffic uh, or need that. Uh, Amos Media is no longer in the building, and that to the extent that there is parking or what have you, the Eversource has the land to the uh, west, and uh, there is access there, and and so uh, they have they have the means to uh, accommodate vehicles, uh, particularly service vehicles. So it it uh, uh, so I guess now I will add the opinion that at least for me it didn't seem as though that was uh, going to be a complication, but certainly. The site visit revealed the extent to which the current parking will be uh, uh, removed. All right, thanks, Bruce. Johanna, you had another thought? Yeah, one additional addendum. Thank you, Doug. Um, we talked about fire access and talked about the fact that the fire chief has reviewed these plans and didn't feel a need to comment on it with, right. with regard to reconfiguring the front and access for vehicles. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Um, let's see. Questions from the board. Fred. I'm there. <laughs> uh, it, I'm just curious if you might comment a little bit. I've uh, been very interested to watch the apparent upgrade of the transmission facilities that come into and uh, that involve this station and, you know, apparently throughout Western Massachusetts. And I'm just curious uh, if you could say a little bit about how this interfaces with that. And I just, uh, I just, I'm not sure what the transmission voltage is, but I'm curious and if you have a few comments on that, I'd be interested. All right. Josh, Justin, anybody want to take that? Um, I can, I'll try the best I can to answer this one. So I, I believe the voltage rating on that transmission line is, is 115 kV. Um, it was upgraded by a separate project though, unrelated to ours, um, recently completed. Uh, it does tie into the station um, and part of the structures that were recently installed within um, the uh, the parcel of land that Amherst sits on is within the substation as well, um, which will be encompassed by the fence. All right, uh, Fred, is that sufficient for your curiosity? Fred, you are muted. Yes, thank you, sorry. <laughs> Not a problem. Okay, next hand, Jesse. Thanks. 
Um, I guess I'm curious about the choice of location for the new switch gear. So if I'm looking at the plan and assuming the red oval, I think it was slide five you showed us, Justin, the red oval, assuming that's to scale, it seems like it could almost fit in the Northwest of the current enclosure. And my concern is bringing the fence so forward to the street, it really changes the appeal of that current building if anything's ever gonna happen there and just the curb appeal, it's moving the, and, and yes, I agree with Johanna that the, Planting will certainly mitigate some of that, but it's really moving the, the whole fence and the eyesore-ness of the substation forward toward the street. So I'm wondering if one of you can comment if that's necessary to be in that location for some reason, or if it's possible to, to put it in that back area, which is already enclosed. Um, yeah, I can I, I think I can answer that. So um, the reason why the switch gear is being chosen to be put in that particular location is because it's being tied into um, the existing open air breakers um, originally or not originally but um, what could have been considered was removing the open air breakers but it would take um, extensive amount of work in terms of outages um, removing construction electrical equipment um, replacing foundations so the best case scenario here was um, to tie into the existing equipment south of where the breakers are um, already existing. Um, replacing the breakers in place would have significantly delayed the project um, over a year or two years beyond the uh, anticipated duration. Will you eventually be removing those breakers, the old ones? Yep, the breakers will be removed. Um, I'm not sure what the plans are for the steel that holds those breakers, but the electrical equipment itself will be removed um, as part of the removals of our project. Okay. Could we see the breakers on the map? I can share my screen if you'd like. I have it pulled up. Yeah, why don't you bring that up again? I think when you showed us the site drawing, yeah. So, so these are the existing breakers right here. Um, as you can see through the lines down here, it does tie into the existing breakers, which is why there's really no room up here, um, considering the transformer equipment that's already in place. But the breakers are these squares um, located on this frame. All right. So this was more practical from a sequencing point of view. Um, and the downside is that the footprint of the enclosure needs to get larger. Is that accurate? Yep. Okay. Jesse, is that, that's the answer we're getting? Yep. Um, yeah, I understand. Makes sense. Okay. Janet, you've got your hand up and you are muted. Thank you. I, I first want to say that um, I was almost thrilled by your statement in support of the NSTAR your application, because I think when I first come on the planning board, I thought everybody would do that. They would sort of introduce their project and then refer directly to the different um, parts of the bylaw. So, you know, so it was really easy to read and really understand what our sections of the bylaw said and how your project fit. So maybe it's a lawyer's thing, but it was really clear and I was, you know, kind of personally thrilled and I hope, every, I wish everybody would do that. Um, I had some very um, very specific questions. I wondered how tall the shrubs are going to get. Um, and then are you using black fencing, which I think the um, planning department had asked for. And then I just wondered about the what the plan is for the brick building and the use of that. If you know, I'm kind of looking ahead, wondering if there's a need for parking or something like that. Um, and okay. then I guess well, I'd, I'd love to see the debris pile go. I think we all do. All right. So, Josh, Justin. With respect to the plantings, um, the uh, in terms of maturity of those plantings, uh, they're expected to be between 12 and 15 feet in height, um, which I think is consistent with, uh, so there, there actually are a number of other uh, tree-lined or street-lined plantings that exist uh, on, on this side of the street on a portion of the property, as well as some of the adjoining properties. So, uh, by adding these, uh, is in particular, these types of non-deciduous uh, evergreens along the street, uh, we felt that it was uh, 
uh, pretty com compatible uh, with not only the, the rest of the property and existing plantings, uh, but also the other uh, plantings on the adjoining sites. So to answer your question, about 12 to 15 feet um, once they're mature. Okay. And then um, black, are you going to do black fencing in the front? Yeah, that was a comment that that was one of the early comments that we received uh, from Chris and her team. Um, so uh, as, as was mentioned, um, the entirety of the perimeter security fencing needs to be upgraded to Eversource's standard uh, substation height for these types of substations. Uh, security is paramount of paramount, paramount importance uh, and their standard, as Justin mentioned, is eight feet plus one foot of barbed wire. Um, so uh, what what we've agreed to do uh, is to provide a black, I, I think it's black powder coated, Justin, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but essentially a black colored fencing along the facade, along the front portion, along College Street, that expansion portion. Um, that's the area that would, would be visible, um, I suppose, if you're either walking or driving past the site. Um, I will say that, you know, you know, if you're looking at the property on the on the left side, uh, which I believe is the, the westerly side, you've got that building, uh, which kind of blocks that side of that expansion. And on the other side, there are also there's existing vegetation. So uh, and, and then there'll be the, that row of um, uh, evergreens that, that will be newly installed. So as I think it was mentioned before, um, when there was discussion with respect to the location of this new switch gear enclosure, um, we feel that the uh, Aesthetically, the curb appeal, uh, yes, this, the building will be will be closer to the street, but there'll be that vegetative screening. And uh, I think part of the purpose from um, Chris's team to request that black along the front uh, was in part because it would be less reflective, a little more aesthetically pleasing. Um, yeah. Eversource is, is uh, happy to do that. And I also believe, um, I know that we had, uh, we were looking into whether the, the, that one foot of barbed wire, which is also necessary, uh, whether that could also be matched in terms of the black color. And uh, to the Eversource team, I, I believe we did look into that, and that is possible as well. So it would be that that eight foot plus one foot of barbed wire all in black along the front. And so um, are there any plans for that, the old brick building? Um, or is that just kind of looking ahead to future uses of parking in that area? I think I can answer this one. So there are um, long-term plans within Eversource to possibly remove the building. Um, there's, as far as we know, it's not, um, habitable isn't the right word, but it's not suitable for use. Um, so eventually that plan would be for some Eversource removal team to maybe remove it, but um, that's not something within the purview of this project that we would be doing. All right. Thank you. We'll go on to Bruce. Um, I have a question about lighting. Uh, I guess the way to phrase it would be, will there be any substantial or any change at all to the uh, exterior lighting level associated with the, the, uh, the site there? Uh, Justin, you can feel yeah. free to correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the lighting that is presently there today is, is being removed. Um, the only new lighting, I believe, uh, that's associated with this project involves what's called task lighting. So the switch switchgear enclosure, the building on each side, I believe will have essentially equivalent to wall pack lighting. So there'll be lights that, are, that will be on each side. And I believe that it, they'll, they will be manually controlled. Uh, in other words, that, the, that this is not going to be a lit up substation uh, that will have lighting that's going to be on 24-7 um, or, or at, you know, during nighttime hours. I believe it's only going to be on, uh, turned on manually when and if a um, personnel needs to access the site. Okay, so you, you don't, uh, as part of an Eversource standard, you don't have a particular illumination level for a substation complex uh, and because you said you're removing the existing lighting. So the only lighting that will be there will either come from these manual switches when someone needs uh, task lighting or from the ambient lighting from street lights or something like that, or, you know, headlights on cars. Is that yeah, that's, that's, 
That's correct. The, the switch here actually contains um, automatic lighting. It's, it's, it's sensory triggered. It's, it's, it's motion sensor. Um, and then the size of the building are activated via manual lighting. So just wanted to throw that out there. OK. All right, Bruce, uh, you're right with the, the, the site getting darker? Uh, yes. OK. All right, are there any other questions from the board? And as I understand the conversation this evening, we would like to have at least one condition that the debris on the north side of the enclosure be removed to the limit of the of your property. Uh, maybe that's uh, too expansive because you've got a whole swath that goes north, probably twenty miles. Um, so maybe, you know, I don't I don't know how we would describe that between the fenced enclosure and the uh, the waterway. Would that be about right? So. Any objection to that condition, Josh? Well, I, I think it's pretty clear what debris what what debris the board is concerned with, um, and my understanding uh, is that it's that is it's located in the rear of the property, directly behind the rear portion of the security fence. Yeah, uh, I don't know how many feet, but um, and it seems to be all collected sort of in in one area. I don't know that it's spread out, uh, but yes, the Eversource is. Um, when we came to learn of this, uh, and I think the, the people on the call here were not aware of it, none of us were aware of it uh, until the site visit. So we appreciate um, the, that the folks who were in attendance there pointed this out. Uh, I know that there was media communications to the um, station uh, supervisor, some of the ops folks internally, and Eversource is looking into it to see what, if any, history there might be with respect to this debris, where it may have come from. Um, there are residences uh, somewhat far away, uh, but there are also some commercial properties uh, that are a little closer. Who, who knows? Um, but Eversource certainly is looking into it. Um, so in any event, uh, the company is comfortable with having this debris area. We could say that the debris area that was described and discussed during the planning board meeting, I think that would be sufficient. I believe everyone reasonably understands what we're talking about. Um, what I do want to just give a little qualification on is just the, the time frame. Um, certainly, this is the, this is a very important project. It's important. It's a, a public utility. It's for the public good. Um, we want to make sure that it, it um, uh, goes on to serve the residences, the, the institutions, and all the businesses in, in the town uh, that this project move forward. Uh, so I. I would it be acceptable if um, the debris be removed um, uh, prior to com commencement of, of work, which would be, again, that would be sometime in the fall period. Yeah, I think that would be fine. I mean, I'll speak for myself and, and suggest to the board that I think having it removed by, you know, I, even the end of this calendar year would be fine. Even better. I mean, Eversource certainly has has an interest in making sure that it's it's removed, uh, and they will do it, and and I think they'll do it promptly. Uh, we're just sort of in that initial stages of looking into it, and I don't know that we have all of the information yet uh, as to what it is, where it came from, et cetera, who, how it's going to be removed. Um, but certainly, uh, we'll we can work with the town to make sure that it it does get removed, and they're welcome to. You know, come to the site and, and take a look at it to make sure that they're satisfied. Okay, um, Bruce, I see your hand. Uh, Doug, I was going to propose a motion to approve, but uh, do you want to invite public comment before or after that? Well, I wanted. Um, I think I'd like to do public comment before. Okay, I'm good with that. So that we've heard from everybody before we put our motion to get together. Uh, Chris, I see your hand. Um, I just wanted to remind the board that you might want to put a condition on that says that the fence along the front of the property would be in black 
and also that um, the Conservation Commission is reviewing this project as part of a larger project, and they haven't gotten around to having their public hearing yet. But if the Conservation Commission um, <clears throat> were to require something to be moved, and therefore it would be different from what is being shown to you tonight, that you could um, ask the applicant to come back to you at a public meeting, not to have a big public hearing, but just come at a public meeting and present the change. And then at that time, you could either approve the change or you could um, say to them, oh, you really need a new site plan review application if the change is significant enough. But that would take care of the of the conservation portion of this. OK, thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, so at this point, I will ask for uh, any public comments that people want to make on this proposal. Uh, are there any members of the public that would like to make a comment at this time? OK, I don't see any hands. Uh, Bruce, you want to tr take another try at your your motion? We now have at least three conditions, I believe. Yeah, I got six already, so uh, I'll list them out. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, if I, excuse uh, me. If I may, just with respect to the condition pertaining to the CONCOM uh, and whatever the CONCOM decides uh, with respect to potential changes to the plans that that we've submitted to this board. And, and the need, potential need to come back to this board in the event that there is a significant change, I think was the term that um, Chris had used in her staff memo. Uh, through the chair, and this question is directed to, to Chris through the chair, uh, is your thought that if there's, if the CONCOM um, reviews the project and then uh, proposes some type of a change with respect to that, that modifies the plans that have been submitted to this board, to the planning board, um, but it, that, that that would trigger having to come back to this board to make a determination as to whether or not the, the changes are significant enough where we would have to file a new application. Uh, would coming back to this to this board for that determination require re-noticing and re-advertising? Chris? No, it would just um, need a, a posted agenda item. Oh. And um, so it's really a more informal process. So it's so more of an administrative that, approval by the board. More, it's a sort of administrative approval. Okay. Um, if the change is so large that the board says, oh, we can't do that as part of this um, you know, public meeting process, we have to have a new application, you know, that's a possibility, but hopefully it won't come to that. Hopefully the change will be small enough and the board can approve it at a public meeting without going through any kind of notification or legal ad or anything like that. Understood. Okay. And uh, I, I mean, I suppose the alternative is for us not to vote tonight, for us to wait for the CONCOM and then have a you know, continue the public hearing until after that, which we often do with the CONCOM. Chris? I think I would advise against that in this case, because I understand that um, this group uh, still hasn't submitted um, revised plans to the CONCOM, and the uh, plans include a lot of off-site work. Um, so the Conservation Commission has asked this group to submit pretty much everything that they're doing up and down College Street associated with this project. And so that you know goes farther afield um, than this site. And it could take a while to get to the point of, um, of having that CONCOM approval. So mm -hmm. I think this mechanism is more efficient, in okay. my opinion. All right. Bruce. OK, I move the, the board approve the the site plan review uh, applicant uh, application uh, for the uh, project at 246 College Street by Eversource to upgrade the existing uh, uh, switching uh, station uh, or, or in accordance with the uh, documentation as presented uh, with the uh, following conditions. Um, I think, uh, well, I had written down 
removal of trash and debris on the immediate north side of the compound uh, enclosure uh, prior to the end of 2023 calendar year. Um, number two, that the uh, new fencing and uh, be uh, black in color. Uh, number three, that the uh, we didn't discuss this, but it was in one of the correspondences between Eversource and the town, and the Eversource has indicated that they're willing to do this. Uh, number three is that the the uh, existing uh, sign reading Amos Media be removed from the uh, the the brick building, and number four that the uh, new task lighting or wall pack uh, be uh, uh, manually controlled and downcast. And number five, that the uh, Conservation Commission review, if it should trigger any significant change, that the applicant uh, return to the uh, planning board for uh, further consideration. Those are the five that I have. I okay. don't did we... and, and Bruce, uh, on the lighting by, by downcast, you mean dark sky compliant? Yes, I do. I think, yes, that's what I mean. Okay. Mr. Chair, with respect to the task lighting, um, I just want to make sure Justin is comfortable with that because Justin may have corrected me when I said that it was all manual. Um, but I, Justin, you may have mentioned it, it may be partially automated as well. Yeah, yeah. the lighting at the two switchgear entrances uh, will be automated. The two sides of the switchgear do have an overhead shielding and are pointed downward towards the ground. But our manual as well. So they're on a motion detector. The just the doorways for safety. Okay. Um, Fred, I see your hand. Um, yeah, I'm wondering. I I think part of the motion should be a finding that uh, under six point two nine that. Uh, the board agrees that public safety uh, concerns warrant the fence height uh, because otherwise it's going to be in conflict with the bylaw unless we make that finding. So that should be part of the motion, I think. Okay. I'm comfortable with adding that as a as a, as a as a as a as a, as a, as a sentence. Um, after the uh, reference to in compliance with the submitted documentation and before with the following condition. That seems about the right place to put it. And I agree that does seem uh, um, a relevant thing to be saying here. Okay. Chris, you have your hand up? Yes, just one more thing. Um... Normally, you say that the project will be built according to the approved plans that were approved on such and such a date and managed in accordance with the approved management plans. Are you comfortable with those two conditions as well? Bruce? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, Chris and Pam, you think you have all that? Mm -hmm. I think I do. Mr. Mr. Chair, on the... Um... Yeah. Building it built in accordance with the plans. Uh, can we uh, oftentimes in a lot of municipalities uh, there is a sort of a similar uh, wording like that, but usually it, it indicates insubstantial accordance. Oftentimes there are minor deviations that that um, are really not material, but and that can be in the discretion of of your staff in the event that there's some slight changes. But if we could say substantial accordance. Uh, I, I I can deal with that. Yes, I, I mean it's this is a very technical project, so I think we would really have to do that. Uh, we okay. wouldn't understand the difference anyway, probably. Yeah, and, and Chris, then, fine um, with mind. And, and the other item, Mr. Chair, I believe, um, as the proposed language with respect to that fencing and the, and the black color, uh, as that was mentioned, uh, I don't think that there was a qualification that what we're talking about is only the front portion that runs par parallel to College Street. The, that front uh, segment. Yes, I, I noticed myself that. I said new fencing. All the new that... fencing. So all well, the 65 feet on the sides too. 
Well, that that I guess that's why I want to point that out because what Eversource had indicated in, in its response to um, Chris's earlier comment on this that 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 Eversource was amenable to that front portion again, that segment that runs parallel to College Street, not the sides. The new fencing goes around the entire property. So. Yeah, so that that is definitely not something that Eversource is, is looking to do to have the the entirety of all the perimeter fencing that that's maintenance and repair the maintenance activity with respect to the other fencing uh, around the substation. They, we want to keep that sort of its typical metallic color, but Eversource is willing to have again that front portion, which would would be screened by the new vegetation, which is. Uh, you know, it, it's surrounded by commercial properties. This is a commercial district along this College Street, uh, so I, I feel like it's it's reasonable that that portion be black, but the but the sides of the expansion portion of the yard, that fencing, we had never discussed that that uh, Eversource was going to that that was also going to be black. Well, um, you know, notwithstanding your conversations with Chris, this is the first time we've talked about this with this group. Mm -hmm. um, so Bruce, how do you feel about that? Uh, I don't agree. Um, the correspondence uh, and Ephesus's response said uh, uh, Chris's uh, the, the board's uh, the, the staff's request was new fencing. Can it be black rather than stark aluminum? And the response, black coating for the front section of the substation fence is acceptable. Uh, my understanding of front section is that it's the new fencing. And therefore, the, the 60 feet on either side of the front is what we're talking about by the front section. Uh, it's the new fencing. I think the new fencing, it's going in. Uh, I don't see why we should have two standards of fencing for the stuff that's new. You're going to be seeing this fence. I mean, this is a transparent fence. You're standing in front of it. You're going to see both sides. The screening is only on one side, uh, not on both sides. So I don't see any logic to... Uh, um, imagining that we would do some kind of facade treatment here because this is a totally transparent facade. So, no, I think we should, uh, uh, the motion, my motion stands. Okay, thanks, Bruce. Chris? I think that um, I'm understanding what Bruce is going after. Bruce is talking about the fence that doesn't exist yet. And so he's calling that the new portion of the fence. So that's the portion that's three pieces of fence that is projecting out towards the front of the property. Yep. There is also fence that's going to be replaced that already exists. And I think Eversource wants to keep the fence that already exists that's going to be replaced as the standard galvanized color. But Eversource may agree um, based on what you're saying right now, to having just that portion that is protruding towards the road as a black fence. I understand what you're, what Bruce is saying now. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I actually understand. Yeah. I mean, I, I basically, basically do agree that since we're mostly going to see this obliquely as we're driving along College Street, that the sides are something we will see. Yeah. Uh, Justin. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll address this one, Josh. Um, so you're just looking for the 65 feet extension of the yep. fence to be black. Yep. The project can, can accommodate that. Okay, so we'd have two, two sections that are 65 feet long that run north south. If you can, I can share my screen to, to sure. kind of sure. visualize this. This blue highlighted section here. Yes. Yep, we can certainly accommodate that as black coated. Great, thank you very much, Justin. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, so, Chris uh, or Pam, would it make sense to read the motion back to us? Doug, we have a second. Uh, not that I know of yet. Chris? Pam to read it back. Okay, so not me. Right? Well, I mean, someone, sure. 
Are we waiting for a second or you want me to give it a go? I would, I would like to hear it read before we do the second. Okay, so this is gonna be choppy because it's just my notes here. Um, so Mr. Colton moved to approve the site plan review application for Eversource to upgrade their switch station. Um, and then we are going to add and finding and the board agrees that in, in conjunction with bylaw section 6.29, that this is a safety measure in terms of the fence height, which remember guys, this is choppy. Um, and with the following conditions. So number one, to move, remove the trash and debris on the immediate north of the project by the end of the calendar year to that all new fencing be black. Um, number three. That I'm sun, sorry. I'm sorry. Did you say all the, all, okay, all, well, expand, as Justin just described it, the, when you say new, you mean the way Justin just described it. Yeah, that, that is correct. Expansion area, not yeah. new. Okay, yes, got it, sorry. Okay, wait a minute. So we're changing the word new to expansion? Yeah, I mean, the issue he has is that they're replacing all of the fencing all the way around the enclosure. So all of it will be right. new. However, some of it will be newly in place as opposed to existing that, right. that's just being replaced. Okay. So I think um, we understand that, Pam and I. Yeah. yeah. We do, we do. I, it's just hard to put it into the correct words on the spot here. Um, so number three, that this, the Amherst Media sign be removed from the existing building. Um, four, that the wall lighting be dark, dark sky compliant and manual. Uh, and then number five is return if the Conservation Commission prescribes changes, return to the planning board at a public meeting um, to determine whether the, a new site plan review needs to occur. Um, the project built in substantial accordance with approved site plan and the project managed, which Chris, I don't know the very tail end of that, what we add. Managed in accordance with the management plan that's approved tonight. Okay. May I make a comment? Yes. yes. I think that not all of the lighting is manual. I think some of it is automatic, which is what Justin said. So we're going to have to um, adjust that condition to accommodate the fact that the lighting at the entryways is going right. to be automatic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fred, I see your hand. Uh, I was just preparing to make a second when you called for it. That's the okay. only reason my hands up. All right. Well, I think we've we've gotten through a recap of the motion, and so I I'm, I just thought it was worth doing. So everybody was pretty clear about what we were doing. If you're ready to make a motion uh, or or second it, by all may, means. May I, I just I'm, add one more thing? I'm sorry <laughs> to say. Okay, Chris. Could you make a finding that it's um, in accordance with the relevant criteria of section 11.24 and to close the public hearing? Okay. Bruce, you're fine with adding those two? Yes, I see your head shaking. Yep. Yes, that's fine. Mr. Mr. Chair, may I ask? Um, Yes, Josh. In the staff memo, uh, there was also, uh, Chris had mentioned uh, waivers, certain waivers uh, with respect to, for example, traffic, the need for a traffic impact study mm -hmm. uh, and a few others. Uh, I, I don't know uh, whether it is the uh, typical protocol for this board to make a, mo a separate motion on waivers or if waivers are even necessary, uh, but I just want to point that out. Uh, that is that is our typical practice. So, 
those probably should be added to. I agree. I think they should be added. Um, and I guess I will leave it to uh, Chris and Pam, uh, wherein the motion they are inserted, but probably before the conditions, I would think. All right. Um, so with all of that, Fred, do you want to make a motion or make a second? I do. I second the motion as amended. Thank you. Johanna, your hand is up. Thanks. I have a question about the, the condition about manual light switches. I'm just, I, why, why do we care? What are, like, to me, there's something like automatic switches and there's no risk in it being left on accidentally. I'm, so I'm just trying to understand the condition. Uh, Johanna, I think it was simply because it was mentioned as being manual, and I thought I would uh, uh, just uh, fold that into the motion because it was only one word, uh, but that's uh, hardly important. I think I just, the more important part is the uh, is the downcast uh, okay. night sky compliance. So we can admit the word manual. I think Chris and Pam were already working on adjusting that to uh, uh, fold in the fact that some of the lighting wasn't manual. It was, in fact, automatic. So I think that word needs to be stricken and and probably just leave it as that the lighting be down, uh, the, 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 the lighting be uh, um, nice sky, dark sky compliant. All right, Johanna? Yep, that sounds good. Like any exterior lighting will be dark sky compliant. We just leave it at that. It sounds okay. great. Janet? So to answer Johanna's question, um, the other part of the bylaw requires that after business hours, lighting be turned off unless there's a reason for safety. And so if they're only turning it on when they're there and they're turning off and it's there, not there. So it's part of dark sky compliance is not just letting things burn all night. So I think that may be why he said manual, but I don't, I, I don't want to go into probe into his mind, but it is important that, you know, lights are not blazing light. All right, thanks, Janet. Okay, Josh, are you okay with where we're at? This gets uh, you what you need. I I am, although at one point I I believe Chris had mentioned something about a, a management. Uh, in com yeah, it'll be managed in compliance with the management plan that was submitted as part of the application, or was that a waiver that was requested? Would you request a waiver of the management plan? We would we would request a waiver of the management plan, yes. Um, is there's nothing to manage? Correct. Okay. We okay. would in addition, any of the other waiver plans that you had suggested, um, Chris, with her, in your staff report. The other yes. plans were the plans that you submitted. No, so no, no. built in accordance with the plans that you submitted. Oh, Chris, I think he was saying that in your development application report, you listed other plans that were, were not submitted. Mm -hmm. And there was a request to waive the required submission of those plans too. So if I, may. I understand that, but um, actually, Josh did submit a management plan and he referred to um, for each item, please see statement in support. So the statement okay, in support I'm, I'm describes sorry. the whole project. So I think it's legitimate to say that the project will be managed in accordance with the management plan, which refers to the statement in support. Okay, so just so I'm clear, <laughs> the management plan is in your mind the statement in support that we submitted as part of our application that's how you characterize the management that it would be managed in accordance with the statement in support okay uh I, I, i'm comfortable with that good we, okay all right are we ready to vote, everyone? No, I'm not seeing any objections. 
So, all right. So, Janet? Are we going to, I just copied, like we're waiving the traffic study, the landscape plan and the fence height. Do we need to put that in now? I hate, or can we do it next? Anybody? Well, I think we added as a condition that we were waiving submission of the plans that Chris identified in the material she sent us. Chris? Uh, yeah, they're listed on page two of the development application report. A landscape plan, a lighting plan, a soil erosion plan, a sign plan, and a traffic impact statement. Those were the waivers that um, were requested. Janet, does that make sense? Yes, I kind of missed. Okay, good. Sorry. Okay. Okay, why don't we go ahead? Um, we'll do a roll call, regular order. Bruce? Uh, yes, I approve. Uh, Fred? Uh, yes. Jesse? Yes, I approve. Janet? Yes. Johanna? I'm a yes. Karen? And I'm a yes as well. Seven in favor, no opposed. So uh, unless Eversource, you have any other comments, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. And good thank luck at the Conservation Commission. Thank you. Much appreciate you. Thanks you. Thank you, everyone. Okay. All right. That was surprisingly challenging. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I, it was a pretty simple request. Okay, so it's 11 minutes after eight. We usually take about a five minute break around eight o'clock. And so why don't we take a five minute break, uh, mute yourselves and turn off your cameras until you come back around 816, 817. Thank you. Or or two fifteen in the morning in uh, current the case. Current yeah. world, yeah. In Germany.
All right, I have 8.17 on my computer as the time. All right, looks like we are mostly back. Like we need Fred. Pam, I wonder if you would bring in Mr. Ba uh, Barrow, Anthony Barrow. Hi, this is Anthony Barrow. Hello, Anthony. Thank you for joining us. We're we're not quite started yet with the hearing, so uh, we'll need to do some introductory remarks, and then uh, we will we will call on you to make the presentation. Great. I just heard my name, so I figure I uh, I jump in. <laughs> Hello, Fred, are you there? Hmm. All right, well, now we've got we've got everyone back. Okay, so the time now is 8:20 and we will resume this meeting. The next item on the agenda, item five, is another public hearing. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended again by chapter two of the Acts of 2023, this meeting is being conducted via remote means and is being held for the purpose of providing the opportunity for interested citizens to be heard regarding SPR 2023-07, Easy Soul LLC, care of AutoZone at 373 Northampton Road. Request site plan review approval to amend site plan review approval SPR 2025-16 to install a roof mounted solar system on an existing building roof and additionally install a low height ground mounted solar system within existing property lines. This is in the BL and RD zoning district uh, on map 13D parcel three. Board members, are there any disclosures as we start this hearing? Okay, I don't see any hands with disclosures. All right, uh, Mr. Barrow, you are, uh, now's the time for you to make your presentation. All right, well, good evening. Um, uh, I trust that by now all board members have had a chance to review 
uh, the plans and documents uh, provided. Uh, quick summary, uh, we are using uh, to install a roof mounted uh, solar system on, uh, on an existing uh, commercial retail uh, building uh, owned by AutoZone. And in addition to that, we are proposing to install a low height, small ground mount system in an open field in proximity to the building uh, of the existing customer, all within the uh, customer's uh, lot uh, size, well below the allowable uh, use uh, surface area, um, and uh, you know, some provisions for um, uh, safeguarding the ground mounted system. Um, I had the uh, pleasure to meet with uh, some of the members uh, yesterday during a site uh, uh, review uh, and uh, uh, entertain some of the uh, questions and feedback and shared information with them. And then in addition to that, uh, very late last night, I followed up uh, with some additional information uh, that I was asked to see if I could help with uh, providing, uh, and I provided that last night. Um, and uh, happy to answer any questions um, that, uh, that the board may uh, have. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Barrio. Um, so, board members, I presume you've reviewed the material that was in our packet. Um, are there any members who were at the site plan or the site visit yesterday that would like to give us a recap of that? I know Johanna, you, you picked up the earlier, the first visit we made. Well, okay, I, I was I was a participant. Janet, you raising your hand? You want to do it? Sure. I I was I was a little hasty there because I didn't realize you were going to jump in. So we, we we visited the site. So all the panels on the roof are going to be on the roof, and I think nobody can see them unless they're in a flying aircraft. Um, and then the the panels that are on the ground are right will be adjoining the building on the west side. They're very low. They're they're only about two feet high, and they're they're just going to be placed on top. Um, they're not going to be screwed in or any kind of mounting system and then the the and it's i mean you can see where the 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 um the fencing and where the array, the array will be it doesn't fill up the entire um grassy area um and then the project manager said if if we wanted it we could have it moved back further away from the street there was some discussion about security and it was the height of the fence adequate because the equipment in the array is valuable like wiring and things like that and I don't know if people steal panels um, um there's there was no like buffer vegetation proposed and it was easily seen from route nine the um building this the um store the place next door is a car wash and I think a gas station um and then I can't I I can't quite remember where the placement of the bike I think the 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 site plan doesn't accurately show that the bike rack is not inside with the ERA, but I may have that wrong. Doug, do you remember that part? Yeah, the plan that we were looking at did show the enclosure essentially bisecting the pad with the bicycle rack on it. And the uh, so we did talk about pushing it back so that it's behind or to the north of the bicycle rack. And then also um, the array, Provide would provide more electricity than is used by the, um, the the store itself, and it's a pilot project because the, the company wants to sort of allocate the extra energy towards other stores that they have that just rent buildings and they can't um, put in solar. And I it's, I I I don't know if this is true, but it sounds like they're trying to get to sort of a net zero in their operations. But I I don't know if that's true. It just sounded like they, you know, it's it's a pilot to see how this works. I guess on buildings I know they own. Yeah, I think I think there were sort of two things going on. One was the surplus power generated here would be able to be uh, credited essentially to other 
stores in Massachusetts. Um, but uh, this was a pilot project for the national network of AutoZone uh, locations all around the country. And it sounded like this was the very first one and that maybe California and New York stores, if it's successful here, they might bring it out in those two states next. Anthony, is that a, an accurate statement? Yep, that is correct. That is still an accurate statement. Um, the, uh, the proposed combined roof-mounted and ground-mounted system, uh, it is designed to offset 100% of the uh, uh, electrical expenditure uh, being used from the, the, the demand at this particular location. And it's also offered to um, uh, overproduce um, roughly about 50% additional power that then is going to be allocated to other uh, rented uh, properties uh, from AutoZone that are using um, electricity uh, through the Massachusetts uh, uh, virtual uh, net, net metering uh, interconnection program. Um, uh, based on the site visit that we had yesterday, uh, I provided uh, uh, some marked up uh, drawings of the uh, survey uh, plot that was uh, prepared that actually shows the uh, uh, demarcation of the solar field uh, completely uh, outside of the bicycle rack. Uh, with the revised dimension from the frontage to 80 feet versus 60 feet. So it's actually set back an, an, an additional 10 or 15 feet uh, from originally proposed. So that way it's all clear from the uh, bicycle rack. Um, one consideration that we gave to the project from the beginning about locating the uh, ground mounted towards the frontage of the building uh, was to take advantage of a, uh, of, a, of a light pole that is adjacent to the corner of the ground mounted soil field uh, so that it provides some level of lighting uh, in the evening uh, near the frontage of the store, uh, kind of a, you know, deter any kind of a activity in that particular area. Um, we're, we're open to any recommendations uh, with, the, uh, with the placement of the ground mounted system, but uh, initially we'd like to, to propose with what we have. Okay, and thank you, Pam, for bringing up the site plan. Um, and so Anthony, this shows the revision with the green line that pushes the enclosure behind the bicycle pad, which is the black rectangle just below the green line. All right. That so is correct. Board members, we, uh, let's see. Now is the time for conversation. Um, we did have a fair amount of discussion yesterday as to whether the array should stay where roughly where it's shown here or whether it should slide farther back. I think there were some pros and cons for that. And we also, at least a couple of us thought that uh, having the fencing being, making that black fencing would be a, uh, a desirable feature of the fencing. And uh, we also had some conversation about the height of the fencing and whether four feet, uh, whether we were comfortable with four feet. Um, and I think that the Farther up on the farther north on this site plan, the propane tank is shown. And that tank appeared to have a six foot fence around it. So there might be some interest in raising the height from four feet to six feet. Bruce. Um, Doug, I, I'm um, substantially comfortable with uh, pretty much everything as proposed and revised. Um, the applicant has uh, been very uh, um, responsive in uh, re in um, revising the material to show the uh, 
the compound in green adjusted to retain the bike uh, to, to to retain the bike rack outside the enclosure. I I I I prefer the enclosure the the ground mounted array to be uh, where it's shown toward the front. I think it's uh, appropriately conspicuous. Uh, I'm comfortable with the four foot uh, uh, high enclosure and and the I think the the applicant's documentation now shows that it to be black. So. I'm not sure we have to condition that any longer. Um, I'm comfortable with the how the uh, the production meter and and uh, and, and um, disconnects and and so forth are located uh, on the back side of the building. Um, I think the whole plan, the whole objective, uh, is laudable, um, and uh, uh, and and it was very thoroughly explained. Uh, so uh, really, I'm just uh, opening my mouth to say I'm uh, fully comfortable with the documentation and the proposal as presented. Um, OK, Bruce. Uh, any other members of the board have comments or questions? Sounds like Bruce is one step short of ready, ready to make a motion to just accept it the way it's been uh, revised today. Janet. So, you know, I I've been sort of thinking about the, you know, we in the solar bylaw working group, we had long discussions about screening the arrays from public view. And I hadn't really thought about the safety issue in terms of the materials inside the fence. And, um, you know, part of me, when I was looking at it, didn't think about screening because, you know, the, you know, gas station next door or, you know, wasn't nothing, you know, there's not that much attractive stuff on Route 9. And so it, it, it doesn't seem like it, you know, you want to think, oh, I have to screen this. But I do think there's a safety issue or like in terms of making sure people don't hop the fence and steal things. So I, that, I just reflecting that I hadn't really thought that through. Um, I kind of wish that the array on the ground was bigger to produce more energy. And I, I, I don't think we can ask them to do that, but if that was a, if that went further back and produced any more en energy, you know, my enthusiasm would go from high to extremely high. Cause I just feel like, you know, I know it's a pilot project, but why not produce as much as you can? Cause we all need that. Okay, thank you, Janet. Uh, Anthony, uh, maybe you could tell us why the ground mounted array is sized as it is and not larger. Yes, so uh, initially uh, we wanted to be uh, more conservative uh, and not uh, try to utilize too much open land uh, up the uh, the property uh, for uh, for solar, uh, so we thought it was a good compromise of uh, maybe uh, using half of the available uh, land area for the technology, and still allow uh, the other half of the open area for any future opportunities uh, or, or, or add-on buildings or anything like that, or keep it naturally uh, to the environment. Um, we could very easily uh, redesign and make it, you know, to take advantage of the whole uh, property, but you know, that was not a, our intention in this pilot project. Okay. Um, Chris, I'm gonna let you go, and Fred, I do see your hand. Uh, um, there, there are questions about um, lot coverage. So um, the lot coverage has been calculated based on the array that's being shown here. And if the lot coverage gets bigger, in other words, if, they, if the array gets bigger, that could throw off the lot coverage. I think Nate Malloy um, is here and he's more familiar with this site. I was more familiar with the Eversource site. So if you do pursue the idea of making the array bigger, you might want to ask Nate to um, evaluate that in terms of lot coverage. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Fred. Uh, yeah, I, um, in terms of the position of the ground array, it seems to me that there's, <clears throat> there's really no public issue one way or another wherever it goes. And so I would prefer that we simply remain silent on the positioning here. 
Yeah, I, I agree with the the way Bruce presented the motion. If it, if it becomes a motion. Okay. So just approve to approve it the way it's drawn. Uh, Johanna. Thanks. Um, so first of all, I think when I I think I jumped up and down in excitement at this project when we were at the site visit because I just think it's so exciting to see this amount of rooftop solar happen, this amount of infill solar. Um, yeah, I was telling my husband that night that I hope it's like dominoes all down the Route 9 corridor. We're starting at AutoZone. All those businesses just start figuring out ways to put solar on their roofs. Um, and then in terms of this exact site, you know, I, I think this plan is good. Um, I am not going to let perfect be the enemy of the good. A couple of things that I think about are, man, now is also the opportunity to have this go from being lawn to more pollinator friendly habitat. But I can under, you know, I wouldn't actually qualify that as a condition, but it's something that I think about. And then my second thought is, I just want to make sure there's enough clearance about around the bike rack that somebody who's trying to access a front pannier or deal with a flat tire or deal with their lock on the front can navigate or between the fence and the front of the bicycle parking area. Um, but I think I'm comfortable with the motion as is. Those are just two additional thoughts. And kudos again on a really exciting project. All right, Johanna. Um, you are reminding me that we did hear from Anthony yesterday that the surface inside the enclosure would be covered with a fabric, with a landscape fabric that would uh, deter the growth of weeds and probably anything um, So for low maintenance. So I, I don't think the pollinator garden is likely, is really where they were headed with the uh, with the design. I was thinking more that like reclaiming some of the surrounding area from being just straight up lawn to a little bit more of a rain garden pollinator habitat rather than just a oh, okay. mowed grass. But I, I see. Again. You're fine. I'm fine with it. Okay. Nate, your hand is up. You are muted. Yep. Janet had her hand up unless it's she, she can wait. I was going to say that fire had two comments in their in their letter and I spoke with Chris Bascom and the two were um, typically want 10 feet uh, clearance around an array, even something with a low height. Um, they're okay if the planning board finds that this is sufficient. You know, it's about six feet from the building. I guess I would, I would question whether or not, uh, I'm assuming there's gates in the fence, or if not, fire would probably want at least one, maybe two gates, a north and south end. And then the other one was a, gra a, a management plan if we're going to be grass within the fence scenario. So I, I was hoping to get a little bit more clarification on what it is, you know, is it fabric and then gravel, or what, what exactly is the material in the fence scenario? All right. Anthony, can you talk a little more about the surface and would you be open to having a second gate? I know you said there were, you were planning a gate at the north end. And maybe, maybe that's efficient, but I don't know what fire would want. Yeah, so so what I described yesterday regarding uh, the access uh, to the array, uh, we have to have access to the array uh, for, for fire uh, uh, codes and things like that, you know, regardless and also for maintenance of the equipment. So what we propose uh, is to have the, the, uh, the actual gate in the, uh, in the rear of the, of this, of the fence uh, so, that, so as not to invite anybody from the front to, to get into the area. Uh, right now we are proposing to have one, uh, one gate on the very uh, 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 north side of the fence uh, uh, if uh, the commission uh, would require us to have two gates, it's not a problem. We, you know, we would accommodate that. Uh, but again, we you know like to li you know, limit the uh, the access to the uh, to to the north side, so as to not to invite any um, uh, any intrusion into the area. Uh, with regards to the grounds. Um, in order to provide for, for good uh, maintenance uh, uh, 
and ground and groundskeeping of the solar array, uh, what we're actually proposing to do is to uh, uh, underlay a, uh, a landscaping fabric um, that you can still, it, it is permeable, you know, it can, it can, it can, it can uh, allow water and, and uh, air through it, but it, it would actually uh, um, slow down or, or deter the, uh, you know, the growth of uh, uh, unwanted weeds um, and, other, and other grasses in the area underneath the solar module. Um, we could very easily cover the whole area up to the fence uh, so as to the walking space that we have allowed between the fence and the solar modules can be covered with this fabric as well. Um, so we could very easily do that and not have the need to even um, have to uh, trim or, or, or take care of the lawn or small portion of the land inside within the uh, defense. Uh, Nate, uh, how, do you, how do you feel oh. about that description? Uh, yeah, the, the fire department was just saying that they would and typically want a professional management company to go in there and string trim or line trim if it was around the equipment. I guess, I mean, it sounds, so it sounds like you're just gonna get like the three foot wide landscape fabric and just stake it down over the existing grass. It's not, it's not like you're gonna remove any topsoil or anything. It just, it seems odd that you would just stake it right over existing. But is that really what's happening? Uh, that, that is the, uh, the, the original plan. Um, you know, if, uh, another consideration would be to, to cover up uh, the landscape area with the, uh, with the landscape cover with uh, 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 stone, um, landscaping stone. Um, we could do that as well. Um, but, you know, there, there are different layers of, of treatments uh, to the uh, to the top surface, so uh, we 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 propose the at uh, the first layer with just the landscaping fabric on top. Would that uh, fabric, once applied, will that kill the grass that's underneath it? Um, it it again it it is permeable, so to some extent it it, it allows uh, some some growth, but it's not a. Uh, uh, it's not anticipated to be a high growth or, or overgrown, uh, you know, kind of a grassy area. Well, it does seem a little bit odd if it would still allow the grass underneath it to grow. I mean, it wouldn't necessarily be a very solid surface. You know, the landscape fabric would sort of be elevated by the grass underneath it. So I don't know. I. Nate, I guess I, I, I agree with you that having some gravel or stone on top of the landscape fabric would be desirable. Janet. This is not what I was gonna say, but I, I hate landscape stones unless they're really pretty. I hate those like white, and fake. anyway. So okay. um, I, just, I, just, I just think that's like a tacky look unless it's like natural river stones. But anyway, I, I, getting back to Chris um, um, Bascom, I, I, you know, if he, if he prefers that the, the array be 10 feet away, because there are times when there have been fires at arrays, I think we should add that as a condition. And I'd be interested in hearing from Anthony if that would be a problem if we just moved it four feet um, to the west. Would you still be able? Because I know. Normally, you would put something that's potentially flammable, like away from a building by 10 feet. All right. Um, Anthony, how would you feel about shifting it slightly to the west? It is not a problem at all. We can easily accommodate that as long as we're not uh, infringing into the, into the next door uh, property. And I think we have enough area to, to make so that true. accommodation. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, Bruce. Um, Anthony says it's uh, 
possible to move it. I, I was uh, not. Uh, I was not so concerned about this because this is up against what uh, is probably a, a two-hour firewall. I mean, effectively, it's a solid masonry wall with no openings in it. Uh, from uh, all the way along and all the way up and so forth. So it would seem to me that the, the six foot six proximity is fine. This is a, it's a, because of the uh, non-combustibility and indeed probably the fire, uh, effective fire readiness of the wall. So I, 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 I wouldn't uh, encourage changing the plan in that regard. But uh, I guess I wouldn't object or uh, if, if, uh, if, if the board wants to do wants to ask that and uh, and and the applicant is willing um i'm also thinking that that uh, anthony's uh, um introduction to us yesterday at the site was that this was uh, intended as a as the first cab off the rank in a pilot in in a pilot project for the uh, for the company in those three states uh, California, New York, and Massachusetts, and this is this is the first one. So clearly, um, the applicant wants this to be uh, to look good uh, and and function in all possible ways positively. Um, I guess so. My sense is, how are we helping that happen? Um, it may be that uh, that by asking for some kind of different ground surface under the array. Uh, but uh, uh, it would seem that the applicant is is likely to be uh, encouraged to maintain this uh, ground cover, however it is, in a pretty good state of uh, a good appearance because of the intention of this project. Um, uh, perhaps we can be comfortable uh, knowing what the intention is uh, as far as um, letting the applicant uh, manage the, the uh, the ground surface inside the ground the enclosure uh such that it works uh, best for uh, his um his promotional purposes all right thank you bruce nate sure i was going to say that you know chris rowan said that the zoning regulations could take precedence over the fire um ones right so it's not a hard and fast 10 feet it's a preference and so, you know, I think that it's a blanket 10 feet, it's irrespective of the height, right? So these are really low uh, panels. So I think if this were something where, you know, it's mounted on a three foot post and the top of the panel is eight feet, they might need more clearance. But given that the top of the panel is like 26 inches off the ground, you know, five, six might be, is, can be sufficient. So given what Bruce said, if if the board finds that the this is is good, you know, it's, it's clearly still then giving enough buffer on the west that it's not encroaching anymore um fire would be okay with that same thing with the management plan they're not requiring hardscape underneath it they're just asking you know what what is the plan like you know if it's going to be grass underneath all of it how do you line trim it or do you do go in once a summer and do it like how do you maintain that without hurting the equipment so they're not necessarily prescribing anything they were just bringing attention that they like to have a management plan for the ground uh, cup, you know, for whatever's on the ground. Okay, thanks. Thanks for that clarification, Nate, because th certainly the way their letter reads, uh, it seems that it's a an order. Yeah, he right. So he followed up with an email to me and said that we can defer to both of you to both of these items, uh, meaning the ground and management. Um, the ask, and then it just said that you know a management plan or something is what we would like to have it doesn't have to be you know doesn't have to be hard and fast um, all right um well i mean i had the same thought that bruce had which is that the wall right you know next to this is is basically non-combustible and uh you know probably a two hour or more wall uh, i guess some of the paint might blister if this if there were a fire from this array but that's about as much damage as I would foresee. Uh, you know, of course, I'm not an expert on fires. Um, and then, Anthony, I guess, uh, how, are you under contract to maintain this space too, or are you simply the installer? 
Yeah, no, so we have, uh, uh, we, we provided a 10 year workmanship warranty uh, for our installation, uh, first of all. Uh, so we're gonna be remaining uh, you know, with, the, uh, with the relationship uh, to make sure that the uh, system that we install is operational, uh, safe and uh, without any, any issues. Um, as far as the, uh, the landscaping is concerned, that is under the uh, uh, current uh, company uh, facility management services, and they act, they actually have a plan for managing the landscaping area uh, on the property. So, um, you know, I think there's some concern about just putting this landscape fabric down and whether that's adequate. Um, you know, I guess I'll throw out whether it would make sense for us to impose a condition that the vegetation inside this fence be kept at a maximum of say six inches of height um, and whether the other board members would think that would be helpful because um, i do agree with janet that just dumping a lot of stone in that area is probably less attractive than maintaining the lawn Are there other comments from the board? All right, so at this time, I'm gonna ask if there are any comments from the public. Are there, do we have any, we only have one attendee. Uh, Maura Keen, do you wanna make any public comment at this time? Uh, but I don't see a, her hand raised, so we'll move on from our public comment moment. Bruce? Um, I was going to ask Chris, I, I think as I understand the development application, there are some waivers, uh, but it was all in hand, handwritten, so it wasn't as easy to read. But uh, there, are, there are some waivers that are being requested, perhaps we should consider those. I think they're pretty straightforward, erosion controls and things like that, it doesn't seem as though there's uh i'll see if i can find where i had them uh, i have that open yeah and um nate probably included those in the development application report maybe he could bring that up yeah I, i'll share my screen quickly um it's... yeah there they are the... okay oh i didn't see that yeah, the it was emailed to you and then put in the packet. Plan, soil mm. erosion plan, sign plan, lighting plan, site management, and uh, traffic impact statement. Those were the waivers requested. And then issues to consider the height of the fence we've talked about. Um, bike rack conflict that's been resolved. Um, ask the applicant if any roof mounted panels will be visible from Route 9 and if there would be any glare. Uh, Anthony, are the roof mounted panels just as only at a 10% slope, just like the ones on the ground? Uh, that is correct. Uh, and in addition to that, the, uh, the actual uh, existing building roof has a, uh, a parapet uh, height, uh, uh, certainly around the frontage uh, in uh, most of the areas in the building that would prevent uh, any, uh, any, visi any visible uh, uh, details uh, uh, on the surface of the roof. Okay. Um, security lighting. Is there any lighting on that side of the building? There is uh, one existing uh, uh, corner uh, hole with a uh, with the light. Um, that's the only light that I am aware uh, in, in proximity to the uh, proposed uh, solo field area. Okay, so we can consider whether we have any concerns about that. I know there's a fair amount of ambient light in the area. Um, new safety labels and plaques. 
Um, I assume those who are going to go on the shutoffs and the other equipment that's at the back of the building. That is correct, and that's all in accordance to um, uh, fire code as well as electrical code and uh, national grid code. Okay. Um, all right, so that's everything I see in the development application report. Janet. Looking at um, the um, Captain Bascom's letter, um, we didn't get a chance to really look at it. I don't think I've seen these, but on number five, he says access pathways, setbacks, and spacing requirements shall be required to provide emergency access to the roof provide pathways to specific areas of the roof, provide for smoke ventilation opportunity areas, and to provide emergency egress from the roof. The plans as submitted show minimum pathway setbacks and spacing requirements. And so I don't really know how to evaluate this. Like did, I mean, I, I kind of feel like we should find out from Bascom is like, did are the plans submitted not meeting this requirement and does does he want to see a better plan or better pathways but we didn't really talk about much on the roof probably because we didn't see it um and i don't really have a way of you know figuring out what the roof system is and whether it's adequate in terms of safety and pathways so i'm not really ready to go forward until i really understand what the you know Captain Bascom was talking about or, or, and to see if those um, requirements were met. As, much, as enthusiastic as I am about this project, I don't know if we're quite ready there because these seems like fairly serious issues in terms of safety and fire. Uh, Nate, um, did you and Captain Bascom have any email about this, about an item five here? No, I mean, I read it that it provides the minimum required and to me, if you know, if they have to shift things on the roof, is that really a, a change to the site, right? So I mean, right. Um, I mean, it's, it did kind of seem to me that we could approve, make our site plan review uh, approval, and then when they go for the building permit or the electrical permit, um, some of this stuff could be ironed out in more detail. Right. I mean, he did. I I feel like if if he had said that there's no pathways then there'd be a concern right but he's saying there's minimum to me it, it meets the standard it's just the minimum okay well okay. i i want to i want to agree with that interpretation but you could certainly interpret it, it other ways right bruce no, we, didn't, we didn't correspond about that okay um in recent months i've come to understand the fire uh, uh, brigades Fire chiefs, fire departments, fire officials in the state have uh, uh, announced uh, uh, quite a um, an amount of uh, requirements regarding access pathways and setbacks and so forth for PV arrays on roofs. So uh, I, I I I agree. I think that's what this is uh, addressing. And and again, I it, I did I wasn't aware that. That this was in our purview. What what happens up on the roof is is part of the building, I think. So, I would think that uh, whatever happens up there and whatever is done to accommodate uh, uh, number five, um, I think is a matter for the building uh, department and the building inspector, uh, and not for us. Yeah, I think we can go ahead with our site plan review and. Mm. I think it's. I mean, I think the fire chief has put it all together. It would have helped, I think, uh, if the fire, if the fire, if the fire department had of uh, organized their comments related to SPR on the one hand and comments related to building uh, approval on you know in two separate sections. In it would have we wouldn't have had to divine it quite so well. But but I think that and maybe we should ask uh, that of the fire of the fire chief in future. But I think that's we can reasonably assume that that's the case here. Okay, uh, Chris. I just wanted to support that point of view by saying that if this project didn't have something on the ground, it wouldn't have come before the planning board. It only came before the planning board because of the array that's on the ground. In other cases where there's only a roof mounted solar array, it's just approved by the building commissioner. Okay, thank you, Chris. 
Uh, well, I'll put my hand up again. Uh, you have more to say, Bruce? I, I was going to move uh, acceptance uh, or, or move uh, 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 move for site plan approval for the project at uh, 373 Northampton Road, the, uh, the with, solar array. Uh, with the waivers and to close the hearing? With the, with the six uh, waivers as listed in the development report. Uh, with the uh, single condition that the, uh, uh, the the ground cover within the enclosure be maintained in a I had sort of neat orderly condition but uh, maintained in in a in, in such as the, uh, the, the 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 vegetation does not rise above six inches uh, um, in height and uh, that we uh, close the public hearing and uh are there any findings that we're obliged to include include chris i see your hand sort of gesturing up a little bit so you could say that this project meets the um, findings of 11.24 the relevant criteria in section 11.24 of the zoning bylaw that's what you often do for smaller projects Yep. Uh, shall we consider that to be in addition to an, a, a, a friendly amendment or a friendly addition? Yes. So that's uh, before the, I guess, before the waivers, uh, the findings, before the conditions, the findings. Yep. All right. So, Nate, you are next. I was just sharing my screen showing that the plans show, you know, a four foot wide fire access. So it is called out on the roof mm -hmm. that there is access around the perimeter and within the array. So I'm assuming that you know it's been designed to meet the access requirements. It's just the minimum that's, you know, required. So I didn't, I just wanted to present that just so we're not, you know, too concerned. Yeah. Yes. Minimum required access because they want the maximum available solo. Right. Okay. Thank you, Nate. Johanna. I second the motion. Thank you. Did we include close the public hearing? Did I just miss that? Yes, okay. we did. We finally managed to do that. And I missed it. <laughs> All right. All right. Any further discussion about this motion? All right. We'll go ahead and vote on this SBR. Start with you, Bruce. Vote to approve. All right. Fred? Approve. Jesse? Approve. Janet. I'm going to approve and put a request in that um, we have some more clarity from the fire department about whether they're telling us things need to be done or it, I find this, I just, I, I'm finding it hard to understand with this letter, so. Yeah, and I think it raises questions about their, their authority and the jurisdiction no, I'm kind of happy to incorporate all these conditions if I knew that's that's what it was. So I'm kind of I'm very I'm I'm a tentative approval because I'm not really quite sure what this letter means. So thank you, Janet. Johanna? Approve. Karen? Approves. And I'm gonna approve as well. Seven in favor, no objections or extensions. Thank you, Anthony. No, thank you all for the uh, very thorough review and uh, appreciate the, the opportunity to present the project. Thank you. We can't wait to see it out there. Uh, so um, for my understanding, uh, for us, what is our next steps uh, to, to expect? Um, do we have to wait to get some formal notification before we reapply for the building and electrical permit or uh, well, I, I, I can't give you the advice about the electrical permit. Chris, do you, do you want to say anything or sh shall he just? Uh... Yeah. Well, it's going to take us a couple of weeks probably to write up this 
um, decision and then you have to take the decision to the registry and record it. And then you can get your permits from the uh, electrical inspector and the building commissioner. Okay. Yeah, that's, I appreciate the, uh, the, the uh, guidance there. So roughly about two weeks or so before we can uh, mm -hmm. uh, process permits. Thank you. Okay. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right. So the next item on our agenda we've already done, which is uh, the first item of old business. The time now is 9.07. So the uh, second item of old business was topics not reasonably anticipated 48 hours in advance. Chris or Pam, do we have any of those? No. All right, so then the next item, item seven is new business. And uh, the first topic is uh, board members suggestions for 2023-2024 planning board initiatives. And um, I wanted to have this on here. I know in the last month or two, we've had a couple of, of current members uh, who are continuing from last uh, session who had suggested some things that we could think about this coming year. But I wanted to give Fred and Jesse a chance to add their ideas as well. So um, the ideas that I've, uh, I've, I've seen, Janet, uh, you had sent uh, an email saying you were su suggesting that we think about the East Amherst Village Center, which I know the board has talked about, and whether we should rezone that area for greater density, uh, that we uh, engage with the process of getting some design standards. Uh, and I know Nate and Chris have been working on an RFP for design standards. So maybe at some meeting soon, we might uh, hear from you about where that's at. Um, then Amherst Center, there was talk about planning that for, for possible changes in the zoning there. Uh, Bang Center parking garage and whether the study to determine whether additional levels of parking could be put on that existing garage uh, might have some findings sometime in the next year. And finally, uh, Janet, your last item was the solar bylaw, which obviously you're on the working group for that. And I guess you have some expectation that the group will have something for us to look at in the next year. Uh, so uh, that's what I heard from, from Janet and then from Karen. Um, Karen has had uh, a long or uh, a repeated expression of interest uh, that someone from some, some, some folks on the planning board have more engagement directly with the University of Massachusetts uh, and how it plans housing. Um, so, and for that item, uh, I know we also, uh, Chris, you had emailed Paul Bockelman, uh, the town manager, about whether he could come and talk to the planning board about how uh, the town communicates with UMass and what's, a, what's the appropriate role for the, the planning board. Um, and I know he had responded to you with some of the dates that he was available. Do you have anything do you want to share some of that with with the board? Um, I don't have that email right in front of me, but he did suggest some dates that he was available and I was going to um, write to Doug and ask Doug what he thought about those dates. So, um, but again, well, I haven't. Well, I, haven't, I have it. I have it in front of me. <laughs> well, you have it in front of you. Then maybe you should bring it up and then we can talk about those dates. All right. Uh, let's see. You should see an email. Is that coming up? There it is, yep. All right, um, so here are the dates, August 30th, September 20th, October 4th, and October 18th. Um, August 30th, that is the, the first of the dates that we talked about having an in-person meeting at Town Hall, I believe. 
That's correct. And you were going to devote that to talking about housing. Right. And you were going to um, approach housing. So that's a possibility. Do you want me to invite him for August 30th? Well, um, I'm going to stop sharing. And I think the board, you know, I, I think Karen, uh, Karen, you, you know, you seem, um, you know, you want to have this conversation. So let's, let's go to it. Um, and uh, I, I will probably not participate in the conversation just because of my position at UMass. Bruce, do you want to comment on this? Yes, I, I want to support the August 30th date because the other two dates in September and October are the, uh, where um, Karen is and I don't want to be uh, doing what she's doing. Uh, right. I won't. I will not commit to this heroic uh, business of mid uh, uh, three a.m. Uh, participation. Uh, even if I did, I wouldn't be able to do what I would like to be able to do and and think clearly enough. I think so. I'm very supportive of the August thirtieth date. Okay, um, Karen, uh, will you be back from Germany at that point? I will. Okay. All right, so why don't we get back to Paul and see if he could just join us in the town room at mm -hmm. on August 30th. So um, now we'll circle back to the larger question that was before us. Um, you know, I've read the suggestions from two board members about things they would like us to think about in the next year. And um, so uh, we'll try to do that. Um, but this is a this is a time where those members or other members could suggest other things and we will see what we can do. So Janet, you're, you're muted. So um, when I sent that email to Chris, I guess like, I don't know if it was like six weeks ago, yep. I, I was sort of thinking like we've been working and talking about these things and like, let's just look ahead and try to figure out how to sort this out knowing full well some huge project could come in or a zoning amendment from you know anywhere right and so my idea wasn't like saying let's let's this is the agenda of the planning board these are my ideas what the planning board should focus on but i know you know the bank center garage study has been done and the consulting report is in and there was some work i just kind of wanted an update on that Yep. I know that the RFP for the design standards has been, you know, it's been over a year, maybe a year and a half. So I was kind of like, what's going on with that? Because um, that will lead to downtown planning, I believe. And then the board has been talking about East Amherst Village Center, which I missed the last meeting. But um, I think Karin's idea is more of like, let's focus on this. And I think it ties in really well with all the housing discussions that we're going to have and the work that Bruce is doing. So I wonder if Karen could get a moment just to present what she's thinking about as a fresh idea. Cause I was just sort of summarizing what we had been kind of working and heading towards. And, you know, part of me likes to be organized even though I know life takes over. Okay, thanks, Janet. Uh, Karen, do you wanna- um, Yeah, oh, thank you. Elaborate on what you were proposing? Right, um, thank you, Janet. Um, I think that the planning board, um, it's our obligation and, and our responsibility to plan. And again and again, we're seeing that this housing crisis rotates about the real difficulty of uh, everything um, being determined by the huge influx of students that are gonna snap up housing that we want to have uh, for staff or for affordable housing to have diversity in the town. So I see it as a real priority to address this crisis. And I think having direct communication between the planning board and whoever is responsible, when the first task would be to find out exactly who we would be talking to, to have this communication make sense, um, that that's something that we should that we should definitely pursue. I think going through uh, an indirect path, having our comments related by Chris to Paul Bachelman um, is not satisfactory because he has so many other responsibilities. He's, he addresses so many things. And this really is such a, a vital, important issue um, that I, 
I just think it would be nice to make a motion to have at least two members. I don't know, we could discuss what would be most effective, but to have some members that have this as their special project that they're going to continue to con communicate. And that means just what I'm saying, communicate, brainstorm, um, have this ongoing uh, discussion with UMass. So yeah, I'd like us to move a little bit faster than we are in this direction, because again and again, when we open our meeting to public uh, discussions, we're getting all these 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 comments of people that are saying, uh, you know, we're under threat here, and this is a serious problem. I know that uh, again and again there are uh, people that are saying, are we going to have to leave town because one house after another around us is getting snapped up and so yeah thank you that's that's why i propose this i think it's not that radical i i think we are the planning board and we should move in this direction of having direct com uh conversation communication and regularly all right um uh, bruce i'm gonna let chris go before you i just wanted to say that I would recommend that you um, wait until you meet with Paul Bockelman because he can share with you how he communicates with UMass and apparently he meets with them every week and they are going through a transition right now from one um, chancellor to another. So I'm sure everything is, um, it, it, you know, there, there aren't settled, there's not a settled situation there at UMass and so it may be um, not necessarily the best time to approach them. So I would wait to hear from Paul Bockelman and then you can ask him, how do how does the town communicate? We also have a new strategic agreement with UMass. And so he may be able to tell you uh, something about what that encompasses. Um, I'm just, I, I, I'm, I, I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Chris. Uh, first Bruce and then Jesse. Uh, Doug, I was just going to say, apropos of uh, uh, initiatives in the coming year of the planning board, uh, it might be good to mention to Jesse and uh, Fred that the last time we met, uh, we actually as a board committed to meeting three times uh, in the next six months, essentially. So uh, to, to, uh, to follow up on a, a commitment related to um, achieving the goal of some kind of goals of affordable and, and workforce housing, the goals being the goals of the planning, uh, the zone, proposed zoning amendments that we had been discussing for up to six months and, and then had voted not to recommend. And the uh, one of the parting board members uh, was only prepared to support that uh, uh, non-recommendation if we if we respected the uh, initiative and effort that the two uh, proposers had put in with all of the time and effort that they'd done, we disagreed with their, that their solution concepts were consistent with the goals stated, but we thought the goals stated were laudable, and we committed to pursuing those goals as uh, basically a, a condition of uh, voting not to recommend uh, that their particular solution concepts to those goals should be uh, pursued. So we have made a commitment as a board in the coming six months to three meetings where we, at least three meetings where we pursue those things. So that's one of the other things that so far as Jesse and Fred are concerned that, uh, that we have committed to. Thank you, Bruce. Yeah, that, uh, I think Chris, didn't you send an email to all of the board with those three dates that would, they were the fifth, the fifth Wednesdays of August, it was August um, August 30th, October 25th, and September 27th, I think. I'm, I'm kind of mixing them up, but October 30th, September 27th, and August. Yeah, three months in a row. Three months in a row. The last Wednesday of the month. Okay. All right. Um, Jesse. So I guess it's more of a question than a comment on, on this topic that we kind of raised. 
obviously it's important to communicate with UMass uh, about these issues. But I feel like there's this third piece, which is the current rental landlords. And what I don't know is how the town interfaces or communicates or who's the body that tries to make sure the current rules around renting are maintained. And if we as a planning board have, how do we influence that piece of this puzzle too, right? Because it's the current status plus the way it's moving forward because it's the current status that rolls it forward that they just keep happening, right? Okay. And so it's really an ignorance that I have. I'm wondering if any of you can comment on that. And if that, how does that become part of the discussion also? Meaning what, what are the rules around renting and who determines that and how is that enforced if at all? Okay, I'll let Chris respond to that. I, I could offer something, but she'll know better. Um, the CRC, the Community Resources Committee, has been working on a revision of the rental registration bylaw for about a year now, and they have um, pretty strong ideas about how um, rental rentals can be controlled better. They're hoping to um, institute more frequent uh, inspections. I think they have um, a definition of a student house that they're working on. Um, and they're hoping to support the inspection services department by um, having increased fees for uh, people who own property and rent it so that we can hire some inspectors to actually carry out these inspections. So um, it's budget and uh, rental registration kind of working together. And if you're really interested in what they're doing, you could um, go on the website and read some of the things that they've posted um, for their past meetings, the, rent, the Community Resources Committee, and, and are, perhaps even attend one of their meetings, uh, you know, a virtual attendance. Yeah, they're a subset of town council. That's right. And these, the bylaw that they are drafting would be a general bylaw, not a zoning bylaw. So the planning board really is, deals with what gets built, not who owns it or how, you know, other than the management plan that's part of a site plan review or a special permit, um, we don't get into the rental registration world at all. Okay, thanks, Jesse. Karen, you're still with us. <laughs> yes. Um, since we're going to have this meeting with Paul Bachman on August 30th, and Chris thinks we should really wait uh, with a decision of this kind to hear what he has to say and to understand it better. Uh, I concur that that's what we should do. But I, uh, you know, I really do think that we have a role in planning to uh, communicate directly on an issue that's so important in planning uh, and understanding what's what's happening that I, I still am very strongly in favor of moving to having a subset of the planning committee communicate directly with whoever it is. And yes, we have a new chancellor, uh, things are moving, but when things are moving and you have a new chancellor, that's also a great opportunity to come in strong and say, we would like to have really direct communication on this. We have some ideas, we'd like to hear your ideas. This is a problem that, you know, is, is we have to work together to, to solve in the best interest of both the university and the town. Okay, uh, Janet. So one thing that um, Bruce didn't say is that he's been collecting information from college towns, like I think it's like six or seven college towns, kind of roughly similar to us in the sense of, you know, we're kind of a unique town being a small town with a large university. And he's been sending out a questionnaire to planning directors and then following up and putting together charts. And the question is like, what do you guys do with your students? Like what are the problems you have and how you try to fix them? And then there's also this international college or university student, you know, town association. We all list, many of us listened into, and um, they had several um, American university or college towns and there's solutions to these problems in, in, that we all face in our neighborhoods. 
um, or there's suggested solutions. And it was kind of, you know, to me, it's like you might suggest a solution, you might implement it, but then the question is, did it work? And that's kind of what Bruce is trying to dig at. And I, you know, I, I think, you know, the housing trust is very hot on this issue because, you know, it's, you know, you know, it's, I mean, the, the rents that are being charged for, you know, I, I, I just want a little thing like the rents for a studio apartment in many of these new buildings is about $2,000 a month for like 350, maybe 400 square feet. And, you know, families can't compete with that. Regular folk can't. Um, poor folk can't compete with that. And this probably is not going to go away. And the university is the driver of the economy in our entire region. And it's it's also the driver of the housing crisis. It's not, you know, it's not the only one, but it's a primary by adding so many students and so little housing. But I think that, you know, we can talk to, you know, Paul Bockelman and get his ideas. But I think this idea of like, trickle up kind of ideas kind of going back and forth I just it hasn't worked and you know he is too busy to focus on it it seems like a really good time but I think you know I think we should wait till the 30th but I, I would ask Karen to sort of think about like a charge for this little subcommittee like what would be the specific tasks you know um you know collecting information um on you know like I think that, you know, how many students do we have in our house, in our town? Like literally, I've never seen a fixed number for year round residents versus students. And maybe that's talking to the housing off campus housing office. Um, you know, you know, a list of the legislative, you know, hurdles, like how does you at mass get its money? Um, the new housing project they just built is a public private thing. How did that come about? How's that working? But I, so I wonder if Karen could sort of refine like, a charge of specific tasks that the subcommittee could do. And that would be, you know, because there's so many things to do, but Bruce is doing a piece of it already and maybe get a better sense of how we could go forward. All right, thanks, Janet. Um, all right, so I don't see any more hands. So those are some things that will either be coming at us or we can try to Raise, raise up and think about and maybe advance on our own. Uh, Fred. Um, I don't know if this is be helpful or not. Um, I heard about the parking garage. What you all might not know is that my name is on that garage as a member of the building committee for that garage. So I happen to know a great deal about that parking garage and I can share that and and so forth. The other thing I wanted to just throw out as something to think about uh, is the uh, uh, the general business zoning district, and we all know that uh, in that district, parking is a town responsibility, and it doesn't have to be provided, and we have height limits that are higher and so forth. And um, I'm wondering if the uh, if if we're at a point in the development of downtown that we maybe we've gotten to a point that uh, the the way the by that bylaw was framed uh, it, it, I I have a sense that the citizens of the town are beginning to ask uh, is it wise that we just keep building out like this. Uh, and so we over the next year or so may want to be just in the back of our minds thinking about whether that should be adjusted or not um i i think that is an issue that uh, i think a lot of citizens in town are are asking themselves so i'll just throw that out there all right thanks fred johanna thanks I think this is a good list that would keep us busy. Um, I was thinking that one thing that was helpful for me early on um, in my first term on the planning board was the run through that Chris did of the master plan and the different sub points and our like status in terms of reaching those objectives. Oh, and you mean when I, I, Chris and you I interviewed Chris for like eight hours. We went through the hundreds of points in the master plan with where they're at. Yeah, that. 
Wow. <laughs> so I don't know. We, so we need to update that, huh? Pull out that spreadsheet from five years ago. I defer to Chris and Doug as to whether or not you think that rises to kind of a priority for the planning board. But I, given that the master plan is our guidance document, yep. I think it's helpful to see our work as rooted in that. And so getting a status report of where we are now and what are the pieces that are moving. And I, I found that helpful. Okay. Well, Chris, you and I will have to see if we can get together. All right. All right. Anything else? I see it's just about after 930. So maybe it's maybe it's time to slide through the last items on the agenda. Uh, OK, so we can certainly continue this in later meetings if you know, this is not the only time for new, for ideas about things we should be thinking of. And, and I should probably get a new computer in the next year so that this fuzziness I keep getting doesn't keep happening. Okay, um, second item we had on new business was the dates for the in-person housing workshops. And I think that we've already talked about that and those dates are listed here. Um, the third item, Chris, uh, you had circulated the assessment letter from PVPC um, with our uh, assessment of dues as being a member. So as far as I know, there wasn't anything that we needed to act on that. That was more for information. Is that true? That's correct. It's just interesting for you to see what um, the town of Amherst contributes to the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And then we do get, um, you know, benefits in return. Um, so just wanted you to see that. It's, it right. was directed to Kim Robinson and also to the planning board chair. Okay. All right. Um, any topics not reasonably anticipated? No topics. Nope. Okay. Moving along, it's 934 and item eight is our form A, A and R subdivision applications. Do we have anything to? None, not tonight. No, none tonight. Upcoming ZBA applications. Anything, anything you might want to repeat that we've heard about, then it might be coming like the, the solar project, I think that ZBA is going to have on their plate. The solar project is coming to the ZBA on the 24th of um, 24th of August. And we had tentatively um, made arrangements to have the applicants present to the planning board on the 16th of August. Um, so if you're, still interested in that we'll make that arrangement i think it would be good a good idea for you to see the project and make recommendations to the zoning board of appeals if you so choose okay sounds good nate yeah uh valley cdc pro uh provided the housing trust an update last week and said that their comprehensive permit project on ball lane it's 30 home ownership units um, is moving forward and they'd probably like to submit their comprehensive permit application in August. So, you know, the planning board would have a chance to review that as well, probably in um, early September, if, if you'd like. Great. Yeah. Yeah, especially, especially, is that the one up, start just off of Belchertown Road or is that? No, Valley's project, that's up on, um, uh, at the corner of Pulpit Hill and uh, Montague Road. So it's at, oh, it's at okay. the old Matusko site. Okay. Great. Yeah, I don't know where Ball Lane is. Um, 63. Okay. All right. Upcoming SPP, SPR, SUB applications. Nate knows more about the than, he, than I do. He keeps his ear to the ground more than I do. So, Nate. Uh, there's, um, uh, there's, you know, there's a few. They're, you know, they're they're kind of similar to tonight. I think they're straightforward. One's a homeowner um, doing an addition to a two-family property in town. Uh, there's one um, dealing with lot coverage issues that may, you know, we've been working with the owner that may come back. Um, you know, and so that's kind of what's in the pipeline. Um, right. So nothing specific for us to put on an agenda yet. Uh, well, I mean, it would be in, uh, you know, we're looking at like mid-August if there was something. Okay. 
planning board committee and liaison reports. And so for Jesse and Fred, uh, usually in September when we elect our new officers, we also uh, uh, choose our uh, liaisons to some of these committees that are listed. So, um, you know, you, you see names after a couple of these now, and those don't have to continue. If that's something you're especially interested in, uh, there, there's an opportunity to, uh, to shift the responsibilities around. So with that, Bruce, uh, I, it took you at least six months to get on to PVPC. Uh, what have you heard this month? Uh, only what has been presented earlier, um, <laughs> the uh, the rates and so forth. It's interesting uh, how precise and all of this, but no, there's been no meeting. Uh, they, they meet quarterly and I guess uh, um, this, is, this is not a busy time. Okay. Uh, CPAC, uh, Andrew has left the board. So Chris, is there anything, any action with that? That usually doesn't get going until the fall, right? That's right. Yep. Okay. And Nate is more aware of that than I am. I don't know okay. if he has any report to make. All right. Nate, anything to say? No, I mean, they were hoping, you know, last year they had proposals for applications out in September. And I think they're hoping to have the same schedule, maybe even a little earlier this year. So, you know, they kind of moved their schedule up last year and they want to continue that. So, you know, proposals will be due pretty early and they start the review process in October. So, you know, I'm not sure if the planning board would want to weigh in on that, but that's the schedule. Okay. All right. And then the design review board, obviously we don't have any representation. Uh, Chris or Nate, anything you want to share about that? Um, the design review board is currently down to three members. Um, I understand one of them has been uh, reappointed and the other two um, have been on for a very long time. They can continue to serve while they're waiting to be um, replaced. But um, the design review board is looking for an, another member and the planning board has an opportunity to nominate a member for the uh, town manager to appoint. So um, new members and old members, you should consider whether you wanna be the design review board uh, representative from the planning board. All right. Yeah, so quickly they have, you know, the White Lion Brewery going into what was um, High Horse. You know, they submitted an application to the design review board that they'll review. It's also a site plan review application that will be coming up uh, at an upcoming meeting for their outdoor dining. So uh, that was a special permit use through the ZBA. It's now a site plan review use. And the outdoor dining is something that the, the board would be looking at at an upcoming meeting. And that's what the design review board would be looking at as well. Any you know, signs, lighting, or anything that's public facing for that establishment. Okay. Janet, Solar Bylaw Working Group, you're muted. Um, the Solar Bylaw Working Group is grappling with the issues of farms and forest land and whether and how to regulate solar arrays on that, which is probably the reason we were called into being in a way, because, you know, from when um, the genesis of the disputes over um, putting solar arrays in on forest land. And so we were supposed to meet this Friday, but I just found out during this meeting that we're, there was a problem with um, posting the agenda. So we're not going to meet and discuss that, but that's going to be on the next agenda for August 4th. Plus we're also having the town attorney come in an hour early to talk about legal issues about, you know, what you can regulate and what you can't vis-a-vis um, -vis solar arrays with the Dover event, uh, amendment. Um, I actually, Chris, I wonder if we should send, I don't know if, I, I think this might have dropped, but did this, has has the board seen the solar survey, the results of the solar survey? So I wonder if we could put that on our next agenda because, you know, it was a pretty, you know, it was a pretty clear um, preference in terms of where the town the people who answered the survey wanted to see solar preferably cited. So I think that'd be good to put on our agenda, look at that. And then there's a bunch of state and our town plan that also has preferences or strong statements about that. So I, I think it's a I think it's a topic that we should talk about. 
but at the very least look at the solar survey results. So do you think we could do something on that, Chris, at our next meeting? I was oh. thinking that this might be a good time to send the planning board or to present to the planning board the draft solar bylaw that we have, not for them to hold a public hearing or anything on it, but just to become familiar with what it what it can currently contains and have a chance to discuss it. And that might happen on August 2nd. I think the only other thing we have on August 2nd so far is the White Lion Brewery that um, Nate was telling you about. They're doing outdoor dining. So um, those two things might, you know, kind of go well together. Um, I'm not going to be here August 2nd and I'm not, I'm going to be on vacation. I'm not sure I can attend this meeting. I'm not sure where I'll be on August 2nd. <laughs> My family, we're going to Costa Rica. So I, it's very possible that I could come in through a telephone, but I, I'd rather have, you know, I don't know. I'd like to, I'd like to be at that meeting more conclusively. I don't know. Well, um, but we could also just send the survey out because it's, it's, it's it's not that hard to read the results, so that I found some of the graphics challenging. We are, if, if you don't mind my responding, Mr. Chair, but um, we are under a deadline to have a um, a draft to the town manager by September first. So I feel some pressure to at least introduce the planning board to this topic, and um, if the planning board receives the solar bylaw in its current state on August 2nd, and then has a chance to at least become familiar with it, then Janet can watch the tape or whatever we call it recording of that um, meeting and become up to speed. It's not going to be a definitive discussion. It's just going to be an introduction. But I, I do feel like, you know, we're really kind of under the gun to move this thing along. So my recommendation would be to have it on August 2nd. So maybe maybe we can just send the survey out because it's 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 like yep. 102 pages long, but it's really only like eight mm -hmm. pages of conclusions. Yep. It's just it's a lot of like, you know, this person's, you know, kind of, but it's that would just be, you know, at least catching up a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Chris, your hand is up to you. Is there anything else? Okay. Well, you are next in that we have the CRC liaison is you. Yep. So this, the CRC, I haven't been attending their meetings. I do know that they're continuing to work on the rental registration bylaw, but um, that's all I can report. Okay. All right. Uh, now it's report of the chair. I don't really have anything to say this month. Chris, report of staff. I'm so glad to have the new members, Fred and Jesse, and um, welcome, and I look forward to working with you. Great. And thank you, Karen, for coming all that way to this planning board meeting. Yeah. <laughs> time and space. <laughs> right. Okay, time is 945, and I think we can adjourn. Thank you all, and we'll see you August 2nd, I guess. Thanks. Good night, and get, get sleep. And have fun in Costa Rica, Janet. Thank you. Thank you. Doug, can I ask you one question before you go? Unrelated. Uh, who who did you want to speak to? Doug, you. We're, okay. we're adjourned, right? We are adjourned. Um,